This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Lee Wesley. How are you? I'm good, mate. Great. A uh, bit of an interesting week. So, yeah, loving it. Yeah, you've been all over the place. You've done a documentary, so called You Lived With um, the Immigrants in Cali, basically the jungle of Cali mm. with all the immigrants. Again, it's a fascinating story, especially with everything happening in the UK now. Mm. And if we're honest, the riots is about immigration. Mm. Um, yeah, mad, but I've wrote down what you've, you've done so much, man. 17 year Marine. You've been involved in four wars, a survival expert. You've lived homeless, lived in a migrant camp in Cali. You crossed English Channel in a dinghy, like great little documentary. And it's uh, mm, yeah. with your friend who will give a shout out to who sadly lost his life. Yeah, um, Paul. R.I.P. Paul, sorry for your loss, yeah. brother. Thank you, mate. First and foremost, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, a bit of rain, a bit of rain in London, so I'm a little bit wet, but being a Royal Marine, we're used to that. The uh, travels all over the world. At least it's not the Arctic where it's wet and minus twenty degrees. So yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, that should be a breeze for you then. Yeah, it's been a bit of a, a bit of a crazy week. Yeah. So I posted the video, like you said, of the um the channel crossing last week. Will it be a week tonight? And it just went mental. And the views on it. I went to bed. I posted it, I went to bed because I've been doing I started a YouTube channel in January, February. February, I, I think I posted my first video. A few different reasons for it, and there are, most of them so far have been travel videos. So I went to Portugal, I've done a lot of travelling over the years, in between my gaps of time off in the Marines, travelling alone. So I got the nickname Lone Wolf, uh, never been married, not married now, and generally always lived on my own and did things on my own. So this year I got back into after COVID and trying to recover the business from that after I left the Marines a month before the first COVID lockdown. I thought, right, got a bit of stability now. Let's get back into the traveling. Let's get the Lone Wolf Westy back and start doing it. So I did at the start of the year, Portugal, went to Brazil, which is brilliant, two weeks there. And it was some girls I'd met years ago when I went to Portugal who lived there. Yeah, come out. So I went out on my own, but then spent two weeks with just the three girls, three Brazilian girls, just road trips, water parks, beach, bike rides. Brilliant. So I started doing the videos for that. I went to Miami on my own. Ended up staying in the roughest ghetto in Miami, a place called Little Haiti. Did some bike riding around. I got a young daughter, a nine-year-old daughter, lives in Georgia, USA. Her mother's American. She's born there, still lives there. Cycling around there, did New York on my own came back, Thailand, I haven't done those videos yet. So most of the videos up until this point have been travel videos. And I hit a bit of a lull then. Well, a lull between finishing the New York one and I'm going to launch into the Thailand ones. And I thought, right, it's, I got into it and it's like overload first. I got all these videos to sift through and where do I start with the strategy with these? And I thought, right, it's taking a bit of time. 
YouTube doesn't like you to take a lot of time in between your videos because he wants you to be putting stuff out there to keep people watching it. So, right, what have I got as an in-between before I get really into the Thailand ones? I thought, well, the Channel Crossing, it's it's really interesting story, mental, but as you said, massively topical. I mean, it's always going to be topical, has been for years, and will continue to be. I thought, well, I've got a ready-made interview of what I've done about that. I could do that, chop it up, put some of my own raw footage in, and do a video on that. It'd be quite easy to to make and quick. I could put that out. That'll that'll fill a little gap before I move on to Thailand. <laughs> so I did that, and it turned out to be one of the ones I put the least effort in. Like the, some of the Brazilian ones, mostly because I only learned how to use iMovie Editor in January before I started doing it. Same as everything impulsive. I'm doing it. Let's go for it and learn it as I'm doing it. So the, the, some of the travel has taken days to make. Maybe be pulling my hair out. This one, boom, a few hours, done. Posted it 10 o'clock that night. And I had about 20 views before I went to sleep, which is good with the level I'm at. I was like, that's a good little start, that. It's usually a day or two to get 20 views. Went to sleep, fine. Woke up in the morning, it was 400. And again, at my level, I was like, that's a really good start. Considering I posted it at 10 o'clock and most people would be going to bed. 400 people have watched it already. Went to the bar on a, a small cafe bar in Swansea. And throughout the morning, got to about lunchtime, was going to go to the gym. I had a quick look and it was up to about 2,000. So I was saying to the staff, I said, guys, look at this. This video I posted last night was just a quick one off. Got 2,000 views. That's more views than any of my other videos I've got. Gleaming. I was like, I'm happy with that now. It could, that could just plateau on, and that'll be a success to me. Went to the gym, come back, 4,000. And uh, yeah, great. So I went home, uh, showed the manager. I said, look at that, 4,000. I, like, I was buzzing. Went home and it started going up and up and up throughout the night. Went back in the next day, said to the manager, how many views do you reckon it's got? And he was like, oh, was it, it was about 4,000, so maybe 1,000 more. I was like 70,000. Over, over a course of one day, that video's got 70,000 views, like nearly the capacity of Wembley have sat down and watched me talking about something. And, and then it just kept on going. It's up to 170,000 views now. I uh, got a couple of friends. Give them a shout out if that's okay. Voice of, of Voice of Wales, they do a podcast and sort of independent journalists in Wales offering an alternative view to politics, which we need, and no matter what side of the spectrum it's on, left or right, they always need a counter argument. Um, so friends with them, and mostly because they drink in my bar. What's your Ooh. YouTube channel? Plug all that straight away as well. It's, yeah, uh, Wolf the World. So Yeah, get everybody to go over, man. Some interesting content, yeah. and it's mad. When you're a content creator, sometimes you feel like giving up. Like, I remember, yeah. I always say this, but when I got my first thousand views, I was over the moon, mm. and then 10,000 views. That's when I was probably at my happiest. Yeah. At the start, hitting those 10,000 views, mm. then it's millions, you think, yeah. Mm. You kind of get greedy. <laughs> but yeah. then the first 10,000, I remember, I, was, I think I was sitting in a cafe with my mum, I was like, that podcast mm. is flying. Yeah. Every hour, you're just refreshing it every five minutes to see mm. where you're at, and yeah. it's a good feeling. But yeah. you've done some amazing stuff. Mm. obviously which we'll touch on obviously the immigration mm. stuff when you went undercover which is such a hot topic and it always will be like you says all around the world with mm. america the uk and i think america is the biggest um immigration oh, on the on the planet place. over yeah. 50 million or something yeah. but and uh yeah and the thing is with these topics you've got to be careful because people then call you far right racist but yeah. i'm a father i've got mm. kids people mm. are just concerned for their kids and mm. listen it's like anything in life people will grip onto something to then use that to then use violence doesn't matter yeah. what color you are everyone has done that so it's just people are concerned in the uk and rightly so mm. there's a lot of crazy stuff happening i think the media play a massive part I also think social media has played a massive part in the riots as well because mm. everybody has a voice and yeah. especially with twitter what x it's called i just feel as if that fuels it because the world isn't that bad when you actually walk outside yeah. without your phone you don't oh, see that I much know. damage and the, the you people the british people are amazing mm. the best in the world i believe mm. i'm scottish you're well so but we'd all say we're, we're kind of good people yeah. when we go around the world it is you you could walk down the road yeah anywhere you live in the uk and there'd be no incident there'd yep. be nobody angry there'd be nobody having a go at you but you go online for 30 seconds your anger levels go up everyone on there's anger levels and everything's just at a higher intensity like you said because it's online and it's just mm -hmm. it's easy to get wound up because it's just online 
Whereas yeah. you probably, you would never speak to a lot of people you speak to online the way, with all the same, the way you do face to face. Because then you put the human side of it and you're like, oh, we're just a couple of humans. And I mean, we, we are decent people. Mm -hmm. But some reason when we, we go online, we just lose it in a lot of ways but that's why it's there but before we get into everything like i say you've lived a very fascinating life which we'll touch on everything i always like to go back to the start with my guests get my, more of a bit of understanding yeah. about you lee where you grew up and how it all began yeah so born in swansea wales place called Townhill. um it's the largest council estate in wales it was at the time and probably still now the most deprived council estate in area in wales so Swansea grew from sort of the copper and the industrial age and these big massive council estates grew up from it. So I grew up there, council estate, and I've seen enough of the world to know that I didn't have any sort of horrendous, difficult, tragic upbringing. It was, but it was a council estate. Uh, on the end of the social scale and ladder, I wasn't anywhere near the top, always... You know, is I look back on my childhood and very glad is a fond memories. I didn't think that at the time because you always wanted a new set of trainers. You always wanted the new PlayStation. Well, it wasn't the PlayStation, the Mega Drive game and the Amiga. Nintendo 64. Yeah, you always wanted the new clothes and going to school and being the guy who had the new football at, at the training pitch. But it, for what I went on to do in life, I look back now and go, that was perfect because it was... We were always outdoors. We didn't have money to go and do fancy stuff. So we had to make up our own enjoyment and our own games and our own trouble to, to get into. I had older brother, two years older than me, and younger sister, Hayley. And again, with that, we lived in a council house, two-bed council, uh, council estate house. Until she was five, my brother was 15, I was 13. She was five years old. We still lived in that two-bedroom council house house which back then nobody battered an eyelid now you'd be like you can't have that two boys older boys living with their five-year-old sleeping in the same room as their five-year-old sister we were on bunk beds she, her bed was just pushed up against the bottom bunk uh she probably slept with my parents and i can't really remember most of the time but it was it was normal to us and we loved it we were on top of each other always out playing around in school i i was good at sports um, it's a football team, athletics team, cross country team, basketball, um, academically okay, but I was mischievous. I didn't want to be sat down in class. Now, a lot of people who left school like I did at 16 with nothing to speak of might slag off the system, the schools. Not for me. The schools can't work for everyone. And I was a very immature lad, which a lot of lads are compared to girls in school anyway. And that system was, just came too early for me. I didn't want to be sat in a class. I had the ability, and teachers would say to me, you've got so much uh, ability academically, and I'd be like, yeah, whatever, you did it all before. I'm not interested. I just want to be out causing trouble, mischievous trouble, not criminal trouble. Uh, and, yeah, I just loved playing sports and being being outside. So that was, that was school. I wasn't a massively confident person um, like you probably were, I'd imagine. I was, I was in obviously popular crowds because I was quite good at sports and activities and I wasn't a geek, but I, will, I never really backed myself that much. I knew I was quite good at football and quite good at athletics, but I didn't, I always had that little bit of doubt about how far I could go with it. So left school then 16, no GCSEs to speak of and wasn't bothered. I think it took me two weeks of GCSEs to come out today, I think. It took me like a couple of weeks to go to the school and, and get the results. Just one bother at all. Left school, went, and from where I grew up and in my mindset was, well, I'm just going to leave school and go and get a job. I didn't even know what university was. Honestly, looking back, I had no idea about it. I knew about it, of course, and knew people who'd gone there, but nobody ever sat you down in that school and went, these are the options for university. I actually remember my careers advisor, when you have your little careers interview when you're 15 and you want to send your own work placement. And I went and sat down with him and he's like, right, what do you want to do? And I was like, I thought, I thought we were here to work this out. You're going to ask me what I was good at, look at my reports, and then give me some advice. And he was like, I said, oh, I don't know. He said, what are you good at? 
So I'm quite good at football and athletics. And he, I'll get you a trial for the Swans. I was like, no, I'm not saying I'm good enough and I'm to have that as a career. You just asked me what I like doing, and I like doing that. We'll get you a work experience with the Swans. So my work experience school was absolutely brilliant. Alan Curtis, a Swansea City legend, two weeks with him. He was youth development at the time, just going around schools and training pitches with him and kicking a football around. Absolutely useless for what I was going to do in life, but brilliant. So left and just got a job in a warehouse. Went on from there to work in the DVLA, civil service. And for me, that was a really great job. With, for being an unskilled, uneducated person, stable job, decent for me, money at the time. But something wasn't, I wasn't content. I was like, no, there's something else and there's something else I want to do. And that was the Royal Marines. And the office block of the DVLA in Swansea looks out towards Brecon and all the mountains of Wales. And I just sat there every day in this office, looking out towards that, thinking, I need, I want to do something else. And it was that adventure in me I'd always had. As a youngster, reading books, I loved the military books. And they, what I loved about them was they were me. I'd read about these guys who'd come from the council states of Wales, Scotland, the, the inner cities of, of England, with no education. And they'd left and they'd they'd gone on this unbelievable adventure. And not just the combat roles, that did excite me reading about them. But combat to an extent, Northern Ireland, places like that. I was like, the British troops walking around the streets of Northern Ireland with rifles going undercover. And these things fascinated me. And from that, those teenage years reading these books was like, that's where I'm going to go. And then... I joined the reserves just to get a little feel for it, see if I fitted them, see if it fitted me, and then took the plunge and joined the Royal Marines. No family members in? No, grand, well, grandfather, Second World War, he was in the Lancaster Bombers, or a legend. The survival rate was one in three for those bomber trips to, to Germany. Uh, but other than that, no, my father wasn't, he's a plumber. No uncles or cousins or anything that, that apart from my grandfather in the whole family that I could think of so there was no influence from family for it it was just in me and I wanted to do it what did your dad say loved it yeah I was totally for it um I can't remember my mother I think she was she wasn't any I can't remember her being negative in any way I think she was they'd grown up in the same place as me a council estate with limited options unless you seek out another option which was what I was doing. And they were both just very supportive. Mother's always going to be a little bit apprehensive because of what you're going to end up doing. And leading to later years when I was going to like Baghdad and that, I was just telling her I was going out to train the policeman. Um, and she's like, all oh, right, that's quite stable and safe. And you're like, yeah, yeah, he's jumping out of helicopters, ah. kicking doors in and doing rescuing hostages. But she didn't need to know that. Very supportive and proud. Yeah, they they were fully behind it. What was what happens when you sign up? Then what's the plans? What training do you do? You do the basic training first. Yeah, uh, different back then. There was no online. Well, I think it was just about coming around the late nineties, early two thousands. They were we had the internet, but you just go to the careers office and ask them about it. Talk to it was, it was and it was a friend who convinced me. He was already in the Marines, and I was like, I don't think I'm big enough, mate. And I'm, I'm not big now, but I was definitely one big then. It's just skinny, as you can imagine. I said, you see, you need to be big. That's a myth. You don't need to be big to be a Royal Marine. It's the opposite. You need to be agile. You need to have strength, of course, and be able to run and the rest of it. He said, don't worry about your size. So I was talking to him. He, he pushed me over the edge to to take the, the leap. You go to the careers office. You just ask him. That was really funny because the eight Swansea one at the time, you had to go in the army side to get to the Navy, which the Marines are part of. So there's this big barrel chested Welsh guard, Sergeant Major sat there and I was like, hey, mate, I want to speak to the Navy. I want to join the Royal Marines. He's like, no, no good buddy. Welsh guards you want. I was like, no, no, I want to join the Marines. He's like, hard work that is, especially with a little lad like you. Come on, Welsh guards. It was harder getting past him than it was joining the Marines, <laughs> <the> basic training. <laughs> uh, so eventually you go in, it, was, it wasn't a Marine in there, it was a Navy guy again, concerns about my size. But you do all the forms and then they send you down for five day pre-selection. You go down to the main camp where the main training is and they smash you for five days just to see if you can put up with 
the full course. What was that like? The five days. In a lot of ways, harder than a lot of the 32-week training because they just want to ram it full of... And they want to see. They don't want to just ease you in. They want to go, right, well, when it does get a lot tougher further down the line, we want to see if he can cope. And we only got five days to do that, so he needs to be maximum. And they're getting smashed with fizz two or three times a day. You do the salt course, you go in the gym, you do the swim test. And at the end, I remember at the end of the, the five days, getting back on the train, being absolutely landed that I'd passed. And they said, yeah, you're going to get invited to come and join the Royal Marines now. But also, like, that was horrendous. I can't wait to get home and go to sleep for two days. The next time I come here is for eight months. There's no, just get through a few days and then you get to go home and sleep for a couple of days. You're here for eight months, sustained <laughs> abuse, if you like. So it was a mixed feeling coming back on that train, obviously chuffed but and dreading what was what was to come afterwards. What was the eight months like? It's it's mixed. Of course, there's parts of it where you have a bit of doubt and you think I never questioned whether I wanted it at all. Cause I was twenty three by the time I joined, a lot older than a lot of lads. And I'm glad that that helped me in this thought process that I'm talking about now. When it was getting shit and you and you were thinking do i really want to be going through with this and living this life i'm going yes i do because i'd already made an informed decision i'd seen a bit of life i'd gone and got a, a shitty job which i quite enjoyed but i didn't want to do for the rest of my life so i was like yeah i do want what's at the end of this so when the chips were down that did pl that did help massively so I'm, i was thinking about the end game a lot of lads they join at 16 17 18 and they haven't had a job before they come from school so they haven't seen and they may be thinking the grass is greener back back home and that doubt can play on their mind i didn't have that where they're thinking is, is this worth it so that helped me massively the times where the the physical part i i doubted myself we, we do a, a particularly difficult fitness test you just scrape through and you think well they're only going to get harder as so am i going to still keep up with the fitness levels and the mental levels all the way to the end so you get those doubts but i was never in any doubt that i was going to quit three of us on the train down we made a pact on the train that we, we realized we had the same mentality we're not leaving this place unless they kick us out or they take us out on an ambulance we're never quitting and that was that stuck with me throughout and it was there's times of training where you hated it and there's times where it was great but like i said it, as long as you had that end goal in mind then it, you're always going to get through it. How many people were at training? How many people? So I joined with a troop of 55 and 19 of us passed. Originals, some of the lads did then pass later on. They got held back or failed a test and had to had to be pushed back. But that number was quite high as well. I think the average is about 12 or 13 from the original intake of 55 to 60. So 19 of us passed and then went off to, to live our lives in the Marines and... I mean, the adventure from that was it is the best decision I, decision I ever made to join the Royal Marines, and hands down. It's not just of everything I've done in the Marines, but coming out, still having that to, to draw on when when you need to. And it, it just, it's so everything. If, if you'd have told me before I joined the Marines everything that I would have done, I'd have gone, no chance. There's like a one in a million chance of, of the, being the person that gets to do all that. And I joined during what I call the golden generation, which a lot of people would just be in shock of early 2000s, Iraq, Afghan, just back-to-back -back conflicts. And so for me, where I was in my mind, that was the golden generation because we got to do everything. And it was, it was relentless, 1,000 miles an hour. Iraq, Afghan, three times after that, escaped a kidnapped attempt from Al-Qaeda, got murder investigation in iraq um got ambushed by u.s forces in iraq yeah it was it was brilliant what was the first two <laughs> it was brilliant what was i tried to join the marines when i was 18 yeah yeah because oh. i was going down the path I, I knew i was slipping early with the drink went and done the test and i think they were trying to send us away i can't remember man i, I was trying to look because i said that a few weeks ago on a podcast i think it was cataract or whatever they send you it was to do like six week basic training mm. 
And I thought, fuck that, I was still partying. <laughs> so, and I, I, yeah, I met so many lads in the Marines who were going down that same route and it completely changed their lives. I was a bit mm. different, whereas they were running away from something. Yeah. I was running into something. I was running into the adventure that I wanted. And both different reasons, but both ended up on the same level and got the same out of it as well. Yeah, it's mad that you went running to it for the adventure. Yeah. A lot of people who I speak to, SAS, SBS, yeah. Marines, oh, any sort of military are running away yeah. from their life. Massively. And it's yeah. a it's a perfect escape, if you mm. if you say, to yeah. keep fit. Because the boy I was speaking to just looked, it was tall, it was slim, it was strong, and mm. it was just terrible. And it was, I can't remember where he was. He was telling us the wage as well, and I was thinking, that's fucking not too bad. You're talking over 20 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Uh, looking at it now, I think, fuck that. But yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it just, and then I went down to the, I was just at George Square. We had the, like, the, not a careers advisor, but you can sign for the Navy or the Marines or yeah. whatever. And the big guy was like, um, yeah, on you go. Just need to book in for the test, booked in, mm. done the test. And then it was, and then my ass went. Yeah. I didn't want to be away from my parents. I don't yeah. think here, even and though I was partying. eighteen, Jack and the lad. Partying. Yeah, but say, uh, what was the first tour you done? First tour was Baghdad, Iraq. What was that like? Um, amazing because of how I'd gone from reading these books, wanting this life, and yeah, I'm going to get in the Marines. And once I'm in, I'll probably get like a Northern Ireland or an Iraq, but on a sort of a basic level tour, and. I was privileged enough to join a unit in 2006. Um, I, won't, I won't say the name of it, but if you read between the lines, you'll know. It was a specialist unit that worked with the SAS and SBS. I will say them because there's enough books out there you can read that does name them and what they were doing. They worked alongside them. So it formed in 2006. I uh, joined this unit, and within five months, we were going to Baghdad, Iraq. And we weren't going there to walk around patrolling the streets, to go on guard duty watching sandbagged um, bunkers or do routine patrols. We were there to go and search out the higher echelon of Al-Qaeda Iraq and the other war infractions that they had out there. So not only was I getting my first taste of what I'd been dreaming of, but it was at the highest level possible. We were going out on helicopters at night, not to go and see if someone's there. We had active intelligence. The drones have tracked their mobile phones. Human intelligence on the ground have, have given us reports of where they are now sleeping in their beds. And as soon as they get a lock on it, with, with all the intelligence assets that the UK's got, this, we're talking the highest level, and we were in coalition with the US as well. We based with all their Delta and Navy SEALs as a joint Special Forces Task Force. As soon as that intelligence came in, he's in that house. He's in that farmhouse. We'd be on the helicopter. If it was in the city, we'd be in a Humvee because we we were in American profile because the British weren't in Baghdad, especially not going out kicking doors in. So, of course, we they, they see a couple of us walking around. What are the British doing here? Oh, they got to be specialists. So we'd be wearing American uniforms, driving around Humvees. So, and then we'd get in helicopters on V and we'd go and kick those doors in and get these people, kill and capture of the, the higher high-end high, high end targets, terrorist network. So not only am I getting this first taste of what I'd always wanted, I'm in American uniforms, I'm using American and high-level British equipment that I'd never even seen before, like some of the night vision stuff they give us. I didn't see it till I got to Iraq. We hadn't even trained on it beforehand. It was like, well, this is it, quick heads up on it. Oh, we're getting on a helicopter tonight. And it was, we landed in Baghdad within 12 hours. We were on a helicopter to go and get someone. So it was just the perfect introduction of everything I wanted at the highest possible level. And you're walking around in incognito, if you like. And a, gro a lot of grown-up attitude as well. It wasn't like the, the regular tours where you go and you have to do all the bullshit. There's people still picking you up for how you're dressed and everything because, unbelievable, it is still like that. It was grown up when we weren't out doing stuff. We could just wear shorts and flip flops, hang around, um, watch TV, go go and hang out with the Americans. And it was the perfect start to to the Marines and going on an operational tour. Why were you put in the deep end? Is that because of your skills or your age or maturity? Why were you 
straight in. Some people are ten years and they don't are not even at that level. They're at that level, yeah. but there's yeah. not much happening. If you know what I'm saying, like mm. you say, people go Northern Ireland or maybe patrolling the streets or Germany or whatever. Mm. Um, why were you thrown in the deep end? It's a it's a bit of luck of where you get sent and opportunities that come up, but it's also what I really believe in is looking for those opportunities and actively seeking them out. You could just join the Marines and you could just just tread water for the whole time. And that sounds mad, doesn't it? You know, the Royal Marines commandos would tread water. But you could. I joined and I wanted what this tour was. So there is a bit of fate there. Is I always put myself forward for the more punchy jobs and roles. This unit was... It was a volunteer thing. The unit just didn't start and go, we want you, and we want that that special. It was a signal that put out to for people to join it. And you, you got to see the different personalities because everyone saw this and, and they a lot of the lads would be complaining, oh, it's not exciting enough. I want to do this. I want to do that. A lot of them didn't actually want to do it, but they yeah. had to be seen to want to do it. Because when this signal came out, Right, we need volunteers for this thing, and we need them now because it's it's going. They're going to bag dad in five months. I'm like, get me down there, get me down there. I don't even care if I'm prepared. Just get me down there, and I'll work it out because I want that end goal. And all all the guys that were making those noises, oh, actually, the missus is pregnant, or oh, I've got to sort this out. And he sort of saw that. So to me, I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. So a lot of risk taking and being gung-ho but in a good way it was just well, i'll work it out when i get there but I, I just want to go and have these things and test it out so i volunteered for it um and that that was pretty much how my career went anything like that came up i didn't want still chasing that adventure of why i joined in the first place it does sound cliche but that is true and it's still the same now after i've left i'm still looking for the, the buzz, next, yeah, yeah, buzz, a buzz, something, mm. and that's how that came about. It's mad because I always mentioned Big Craig, but Craig Harrison, he was the world's longest. Yeah, sniper I've seen, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, got, I got the book and the audio book. Of, yeah, yeah, fucking unbelievable, man. I love Craig, and uh, mm. he struggles massively with his mental health, mm. but he would rather be in a war zone killing people mm. than be here in peace because yeah. he feels more at peace. Yeah, and war, mm. and that's powerful. Yeah. It's madness mm. because nobody's lived that. So how does a kid from Wales, Swansea, mm. then crave that adventure and putting their hand up first to be kill or kill mm. to then all the big? You know yourself when the shit hits the fan, mm. you know there's only one percent that go fuck it, yeah. And action speaks louder than words. But all the talk mm. and everybody saying we'll do this and the adventure because I remember playing with like tanks and guns and. That was in your mind. That's what all you want to do is fucking. Mm. It's mad to be conditioned to go and kill people. It's crazy, mm. but it's mad to see the asses that go when the shit hits the fan. And that's the majority of the world. Mm. And that's yeah. why the place, especially the UK, is as weak as it is because not many's got asshole anymore. Mm. And that's the fucking mad thing. Did you start seeing people from who they were? Did you disconnect from those people once you started seeing? who was made of the real stuff yeah. and who wasn't. Yeah, and it happens naturally because the, the, the organisation is set up that way. The people who want to go and, and put themselves in that position and want to chase the something that's a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more difficult to achieve, which is going to put themselves under more stress to get it, they'll naturally do it. When you join the Marines, a lot of people know this, you, can, you choose your career path as well. You don't just join the Marines and we're all just Marines. You could be a physical training instructor, a driver, a clerk, a storeman, a communications expert. I was weapons and tactics. So from the off, I was like, well, I'm going to go weapons tactics because there's more chance of me getting into these specialist units of going and being the guy in these teams who are going out to combat. If I say, oh, I want to go and be a, a driver, well, I ain't going to be kicking doors in and throwing gr gr grenades in. So it, it naturally does that. You you will you will make your own destiny by choosing a certain path. And if you don't get one thing, eventually you're going to gravitate towards it because you want to go in that direction. If you don't, there's lots of options for you to not go and do that. So it ends up when you get to these types of units and these teams, the people there have been put there because of their own initiative. 
nobody's you're never going to have an organization like the royal marine commandos operate with with pressed men who don't want to do something but you do get some guys who end up there who are a bit half-hearted like you say but they get found out and they'll get got rid of that unit we joined a lot of guys got there and they're obviously at a high level they, you wouldn't get in the marines and if you were just a couch potato but he didn't have enough and it was you're a nice lad your heart's in the right place but you're not really fit for this role you're going to a different unit where you're going to be more suited what makes a good tactician and we're obviously a I've read The Art of War, it's a fucking great book, you can probably read mm. it in a day, but what makes a good tactician for battle? What makes a mm. good leader? I, leadership for me is a lot about personality. And there's a lot, there's, you couldn't define the leadership in black and white, otherwise we wouldn't have people doing leadership talks. There'd just be one thing, book to read about it, and that, that would be it. So like you say, you've got all these different views on it. And I wrote is a quote at the start of my book, which I'd, I was doing a leadership talk for HSBC managers in Swansea. And before doing this this talk, I was like, I'm going to have to come up with my own little spin on it now. Just a little tagline, just to put at the end, and go, this is my thing. And I presented him with like a, a, a picture with it on there. And the quote is, the first steps to becoming a great leader are simple. Be honest and be yourself. Because nobody's going to follow a fraud into battle. And I didn't just come up with that because it sounds punchy. That was, I thought, let's come up with something that I believe in. So in my leadership style, and it was always, it's times to go by the book and go, all right, lads, this is what we've got to do, but I'm put on a bit of a persona. But you can't be a leader like that. And we all get them in all our lives where they, they just have a certain style and they stick to the book because they haven't got their own ability to put their personality on it. And with that that saying, if if you're leading and commanding a, a group of people and you're around them all the time, like you are in the Marines, there's we go places, you don't you are with each other every minute of the day. If then when you're in your command position, you start acting differently, the lads are gonna be like, Whoa, where's where's this person come from? He's not normally like that when we're hanging around. And they're gonna start doubting you. Well, is he just doing that because he doesn't really know? what his leadership style is and he's just now reverting back to the book well this is what the book says so I, i'm not sure i've got to do it you got to blend obviously experience your knowledge with your own personality and put that spin on it a lot of people can't do that sorry mate lost me there But a big thing for me as well is with the tactics side, you can argue tactics as much as you want, but you've got to try and be level-headed about it. And that's not just being calm in that sense, but a lot of the times in situations where you had time to work out a plan, it wouldn't just be, all right, I'm in charge. This is what we're doing. I'd go to the crowd and me and an officer had a really great relationship. He was a paratrooper as a Marine, so traditional enemies where he was the officer, I was the sergeant. The, the officer commander would tell him, right, this is what you got to do with your troop. He'd come in, close the door, right, Westy. OC said this, this is what we got to do. What do you reckon? I'd give him my spin on it. He'd give me his spin. We'd argue it out, bat it off each other, and then come up with a, a plan in the middle. And then that's great because not only am I invested in it, when I'm telling the lads what to do, I'm invested in it. I believe in it now because I've had a part in that plan. And the lads will see that as well. Going back to the thing, nobody's going to follow a fraud in the battle. If they don't trust you, if they don't if they see straight through you, when it comes to stepping over that line, they ain't going. They're like, I don't, I don't trust in you. Um, so I think that's a massive part of it is trying to blend your personality into all the official things that you need to do to be a commander. Mm -hmm. What was it like in war for the first time? With the, the violence, the guns, the bombs, the killings. How was that feeling? It's very the same and different to what people probably think. You've got the violence. When it when it gets violent, it gets violent very quickly. And it, it's extreme. It happens and you've got to act with the extreme violence in return or you're going to get hurt. But there's also a lot of routine where there's not violence and there's not danger. And 
you got to control that because if you walk around Helmand province for six months, twitchy and always worrying about what could happen, where's the next danger, what if this, what if that, you're going to burn out in a couple of days. You can't sustain that type of mentality. So a lot of time it's just backing yourself as in not arrogance, but a little bit of arrogance to go, well, I am in control for now because it, if I just go around thinking I'm not, then I'm going to put myself in more danger because when something happens, I'm already going to be at a thousand feet and climb in and I'm going to start panicking, making uh, wrong decisions. So it's a balance. Yeah. You get, you get the times where it does go off and it's full on and extre extreme and then it brings it down and you, and you gotta, you gotta control that because when something does go off and it's quite severe, people losing limbs, dying, you've all then got to regroup and get together. And you've got to control the lads because if you start letting them get get to them, more people are going to get hurt again. Um, so it's it's a contrastive war. A lot of people might think it's like the movies you go there and it's full on like scrapping for six months. So it, it's a fine balance. I I treasure my experience from all of the wars and everything I did in the Marines. The crippling lows to the massive highs all added to my perspective and my experience on life. And one of the biggest things I got from it was learning about myself. And I don't want to say that in like a corny, cheesy way, but you join the Marines, you doubt yourself whether you could be a Marine. You get there, brilliant. Well, now I've got to go and do the job as a Marine. Am I up to that as a Marine can be? You're told you're the best. You're the best prepared you, you can be. And then, right, you're going to Iraq, you're going to Baghdad. This is the hottest place on earth in 2006. Not just weather-wise. And you're like, well, am I going to be up to it now? Am I going to let people down? Am I going to let myself down? And when it comes to the crunch, as you said earlier, that I find out that about myself that I haven't really got it, got what it takes. Because you're never sure if you have when it comes to the crunch. Nobody knows how they're going to act in a bank robbery unless they've got a gun pointed at their head. You could think you're going to act a certain way, but you, you don't know. So you go into it with that in mind. Am I going to let people down? Am I going to come up trumps? So the, the biggest thing I take away from it then is that I did prove that to myself. Nobody's ever prepared for war completely. I don't care what anyone says or what they tell you. All you can be is as prepared as you can for it, for when you get there. But no, that's never completely prepared because you don't know what's going to happen. And you can you can be prepared for operations and tasks that are going to happen, but actual combat, you're never going to be fully prepared until you get there. So it, one of the biggest things I took away from combat was being able to see how I was in the face of it. When do you lose yourself, though? When do you completely lose it? Not mentally but where you don't you can't really separate real life to well it's all real life but you know what i'm saying from a mm. war zone getting orders to then trying to come back and separate it to be a father or a friend or mm. a loving brother or a loving son how can you separate it because i've spoke to enough men like any any man who's done service or whatever it's unbelievable and mm. listen whether you agree with wars or whatever it's a whole different story but people in the right mind think they're doing the right thing, going, taking orders, going to fighting terrorists and whatever. Then um, Peter McAleese, who I had on, God rest his soul, passed away. He's a mad old bastard. <laughs> and I've interviewed enough people to see the, the strain. I do a lot of homeless work to see a lot of the soldiers dying on the streets, whether over in other mm. countries, fucking fighting for their country, but nobody gives a fuck for them. Mate. Here, like, I've seen the people who love it and the people who wish they never done it. Mm. It's... Um, it's two ends of the spectrum and Peter McAleese, he was just, I interviewed him, he was going to kill Escobar, his helicopter crashed, mm. he was just a tough fucking old bastard, yeah. he was tough, mm. like if you're going into war, you're wanting him with uh, you, yeah. he just, different mindset, he had mm. the twinkle still in his yeah. eye, didn't care, I'd done what I'd done, mm. so fucking what, you know, uh, yeah, but when do you, when does, did you, mm. did you ever lose yourself, or, do you try and just go, okay, it's, this is a job? Like when did you start seeing changes in your mind? Yeah. It's it's difficult to to transition. And 
I like going to the, like the homeless stuff. We you touched on it when um, trying to have something else to occupy you. I've uh, written a piece about it as well as what I compared somebody coming off the streets to somebody coming back from war. And he talked about Craig where he said he got back and I'd rather be out there. And in a lot of ways, it's because it's a much more simple life out there. And don't confuse simple with easy because it isn't easy. But your life when you are at war is simple. You get up every day and your list of tasks that day are pretty straightforward. Look after my kit, eat, stay hydrated. If we're going out on patrol or whatever we're going out on, look after myself and the lads, hopefully take a few enemy out along the way. There's no the banker ringing me about this. All the petty mundane stuff that we let get us down in the real world, which we shouldn't, because when you got there, you realize it's petty, it's gone. You forget about it. And you're only thinking about those very basic tasks. So when you get home and you do go to the post office and you're getting scorned by the old lady there because you can't fill the form in properly. And you're thinking, well, two weeks ago, I was, I mean, grabbing the Taliban by the scruff of the neck and <laughs> saving people's <laughs> lives on stretchers. That's a hard thing to, to deal with. And that's what I think a lot of people struggle with coming from that massive high of, and I'm not talking about high of euphoria, like winning a football match. I'm on about every single emotion you can imagine gets thrown at you in war. And if you've gone into the, the, the high end of it, the spectrum of combat. And I wrote a piece about it uh, again, <laughs> talking about writing all the time in one of my books, uh, I call it war, but glory. And this came from, I was in New York. I got back from one of my trips and this ties into it. I get back. I ain't sitting in the house for four weeks, which I give you off when you get back. I'm going off to do something to occupy myself, which hugely tied in with it. Because if I sat sitting in the house on my own, never married, brain rot. And I was in New York on one of my trips and sat in a, in a bar with my friend out there. And a couple were chatting to me. He said, he just got back from Afghanistan. Wanted to know about the experiences, naturally. So I told him a few stories and was quite animated with it, uh, with the way I told it, quite um, sort of enthusiastic. And I could see the sort of faces changing towards the end of it. And then it stopped and they went, well, it sounds to us like you're glorifying war. And I was like, all right, he's a bit stunned by it. And one time I got to the airport a couple of days later, I sat down and thought about it. And I was like, well, how dare you say that to me? Because unless you've been there and seen that you can't really relate to it because war and i write in the thing war is everything and by that it does sound like glorifying it oh it's everything it's amazing no i mean it's every emotion every emotion you can think a human person is going to go through they go through at war from the, the highs the crippling lows compassion sadness elation boredom or frustration right it, Everything's in the mix. So when you go from living a life where we're used to emotions every day to everything being thrown at you at once, and it suddenly it stops and you're told, go home, have some time off, go and be a real person. Well, it's difficult to bring yourself down from that. And one year I got back from uh, one of my trips, I broke my collarbone. And so the Marines were like, well, you're not going to give you time off, but you're in a sling, you're not going to be kicking doors in, jumping from assault courses. So in my downtime, I decided to build a sports bar in my dining room. And my girlfriend at the time, she worked with a friend of mine and she went into work and went, I went around there yesterday. He's up on a ladder with a broken collarbone, stapling football jerseys to the ceiling of his dining room. He's got a broken collarbone. And my mate just went, yeah, but that's Westy. Do you think he was going to sit in the house for four weeks and do nothing? He'd drive himself insane. So I'd liken that to coming off the streets. And a lot of people, I think, when they come off the streets, it's because they've lived that very simple life. Not easy, but simple on the streets. What are we going to do today? Do a bit of begging. Maybe buy a couple of cans of cider or lager. Find somewhere to sleep. For, or just find something to interest me for the day. And then they come out of that, their very straightforward existence, and they get given accommodation. They've got to manage the bills. They got to get a job, get some income. They got to keep place tidy, have meetings, all the rest of it, and they can't cope with it. The head goes, they trash the place, and get sent back in the streets a lot of the time on purpose. They may not be saying that it's on purpose, but there's something in there that's not right. 
and they're not used to that routine and mundane lifestyle. It's like people in prison, the majority go back, especially the people with bigger sentences. Yeah. They're just so used to it. They're just so yeah. uh, caught up in the system where they're just so programmed to just being, like you say, simple. But yeah. they might not have anything, but the stress free, you're not worrying about your misses or bills or police at the door, you're already in prison. Yeah. That's why a lot of people do have as well. Came into my bar, we run my military charity from as well. Guy came out a few weeks ago. They referred him to me or referred him, just said, come there, I'll, I'll give him a coffee and a chat. He'd been in for life. He was in the Welsh Guards, he was in the army. Made a mistake, I don't know exactly what. When he was a young man, he'd been in prison for life. He's come out and I knew straight away that he weren't going to last. I just knew he was lost, completely lost. He'd come to talk to me. I then see him hanging around with the wrong type of people out in town because they had him in like a refuge in town. And within two weeks, he'd broken his conditions, which was he'd ripped something, the tag thing or whatever, off his ankle or broken a minor rule, knowing that he'd send it back in without doing a, a serious crime. And he's back inside now. And is it, he come on, he's lost, completely lost. What, where am I going to go? What am I going to do with my life? Because you don't know anything of life, else. Yeah, institutionalized, and it's the pressures of life. Life is pressure, constant, mm. trying to keep c compete. Getting mortgages for 25 years, that's a pressure. Should I be married? Should I have kids? Should I do this? It's, should I be wearing this? And it's, uh, it is, it's constant. And that's why a lot of people struggle mm. from all walks of life. Millionaires, homeless, yeah. veterans, nurses, doctors, everybody. Yeah. But it's just trying to find that happy medium. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You see a lot of good professional sports and musicians. Mm -hmm. and you, you played football at a decent yeah. level. And very similar again, I guess, to the Marine and the the homeless thing, but in a different way. They've lived that life of chasing that goal, chasing that goal and having the buzz of their career and all the highs and lows of it. And then they retire and normal life hits them. Where's where's my motivation now? Where's my buzz? I've done everything that I dreamed about doing from when I was eight years old. What the hell am I going to do with it now? Um, Can you burn the receptors of the adrenaline? where you don't really feel anything, where you become cold to everything? I think I have definitely numbed a lot of that. It's a great point. Even down to like when I take my daughter to the water park or whatever, you mean I'll do something that would get a little bit of a thrill and just a bit like, mm, that was okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm the same, bro. Yeah. Listen, I don't know if it's the drugs, but yeah. the gambling every day, the constant dopamine mm. highs. I don't really get... I should be set like if it was 20 years ago, I'd be celebrating so much more with the things that I'm achieving. Yeah. Oh, but I'm just feeling not dead inside, you know what yeah, I'm saying? I'm not a, a fucking numbed. psychopath, but well, maybe I am, but it's just <laughs> um it's just nothing. Yeah. And it frustrates me because I hit these goals and hit these targets, but it just doesn't feel I love seeing other people happy. Mm. Seeing my kids happy, mm. my mum, my sister. Yeah. That me that genuinely like we were yeah. all away for the weekend up in Scotland playing Uno and everybody's fighting and arguing. I fucking love that. Mm. That's, um, I'm happy then. Mm. But take away all the other, the shit, I just think, I'm just, that's fucking strange. I'm yeah. good when I'm with for other people. I don't mm. know if I pretend. Yeah. Um, but, I'm the same, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know Thailand what trip I did recently. I was at, went out on my own. I went to a wedding. What was that there? But the other times on my own. And I was sat at this resort. It was like paradise. Thailand on one of the islands. Just laying there and I was like, I'm bored or, it's not bored, it's just, like you said, it numbed. Most people now would be would just be in absolute heaven with this. And I just was unsettled with it. I was like something I'm not in really enjoying this. Whereas ninety nine percent of people would would be loving this. It's a dream location for them. And it's it's just something went right. And why I go on all these crazy adventures is I've identified it hundred percent because of that lull in the adrenaline, the adventure, the the spike during I left the Marines, COVID hit, and I had a, a really rough spell. Hit the hit the drink, sat in the house, gone from 17 years of living my life for a thousand miles an hour. I bought a business to go into to do the transition from the Marines into civvy life. A month later, boom, COVID lockdown. Not married, didn't even have a dog at the time. Sat so I've gone from this thousand miles an hour, 17 years, to being sat in the house, can't even leave the house or do anything on my own, going what the fuck's happened? Yeah. Hit the drink. Because I just lost all 
focus or purpose. It's like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And my best friend, Paul, who passed away, I remember he, he'd come around, he was, trying to, he was doing it for, for my benefit, obviously, trying to get a grip of me. He was trying everything to try and snap me out of it. And one of the things he, he turned around and said to me, he was like, I don't understand it, mate. He said, you got money in the bank, right? you got your pension from the Marines now as well, so you're pretty secure. You got your own house, mortgage pretty much paid off. You got a camper van. You got a beautiful daughter in the States, right? You got, you got all this going for you. I don't understand why this happened. And I said that, but that isn't always enough, Paul. You're like a Robin Williams, adored, multimillionaire. I right? had everything, could have done anything you wanted. He weren't, he weren't happy. It wasn't enough for him. Amy Winehouse had it, the world at her feet, but it wasn't, there was some, still something missing. And I definitely feel that the Marines, maybe I'd have been like this anyway. I don't know, mm -hmm. but the Marines have definitely played a part in numbing a lot of things but i'm aware of it like i said because i'll say i'll do something i was like oh that was a bit shit and then i got himself was it or yeah. is it just shit to me because rather than just slagging something off i'm aware of it now rather than saying yeah that was shit all right well have a, have a think it's probably good probably amazing to a lot of other people it's just i because i'm so numb to it now it was okay it's mad that feeling all right you say your amy winehouses your michael jackson's your whitney houston's your robin williams gary speed mm. like, yeah you just I don't know, like you say, if you never joined the Marines, and I blame the drugs and the gambling consistently because does it affect the brain, but whether I took drugs or not, I don't know if I'd still be feeling like this at my age anyway. Yeah. You don't know what, some, what it is from the TV you watch, the phones or all the fucking mm -hmm. chemicals that are in your food. Something that triggers it, and like you say, do you think if you never went to the Marines, you'd have still felt like that? Or, but again, what the fuck can we do? All we can do is try and live. Did you see yourself slipping then because you never had that regime of day-to-day -day orders to then, yeah. what the fuck did I do? Yeah, I, I never, I had really dark, I should have died during COVID. I was found in a ditch by a nurse on her way to hospital because I'd escaped from the hospital because I needed to have a drink because the place was just driving me mad and people screaming on the wards. I was going back for every intention after I'd necked a bottle of rum from the shop <laughs> um that's a really funny story because to get to the shop the there was a well i went to a news agent and i walked in and i still got the, the um cannula from from hanging out of my arm from the hospital i just need a drink and i'm gonna go back and i walked in and my cousin's wife was working in the news agents and i was just like and she knew about what was going on so i had to escape out of there and but there was only one way to the other shop so i had to walk back as if I was going back to the hospital, I told her, oh, I just need a glass, uh, a bottle of Coke, and then I'm going back. I've had enough. Or I need a break. So then I had to get back down. So I had to crawl. I waited till somebody walked in the shop because there was only one way. I had to walk past the window of the news agents. So I had to crawl underneath this window to get past her shop to go down and get it. On the way back, I collapsed in the ditch, woke up in a coma, about a day later or whatever, uh, with the nurses saying, we didn't think you were going to wake up. So it got pretty dark. And I'll never blame anyone or any instance for it. It was full accountability. I let it happen and it's happened. But there were a lot of circumstances that facilitated me slipping into that. I'd left the Marines a month before that first lockdown hit. They closed the business, so I couldn't even go that to occupy myself. And then, like I said, after 17 years, there's... No accountability, no structure, no routine. It was I was a colour sergeant by the time I left, so I was the one implementing that structure and routine to people, giving people the orders. So there's even more responsibility on me. It's not just I have to do something. I have to do something and coordinate 100 people to do it as well. So then to go from that and sit in the house was bizarre. And I got my young daughter in the States. You're like, well, you ain't going to go and see her anytime soon. And she ain't coming over because of the travel ban. And I was like, well, if I have a drink today and I'm feeling rough tomorrow and I don't want to go anywhere, nobody's going to be ringing that phone going, why haven't you come to work? Why haven't you done this? Why aren't you doing that? There's nobody to check in on me. So that absence did allow me to let myself go into it. Whereas when we talk about oh, what, am I chasing adventure or whatever, there was no adventure to chase. There was a, a thousand things I could have been doing, writing more books, learning Spanish, playing piano, but I didn't have to do them. And that was the key thing for me. It was like, the, 
And that's the key thing in my whole life. Whereas if I don't have to do something, I'll put it off till it does, till somebody grips me and says, you got to do that now. So I allowed myself to slip into it because those circumstances allowed me to allow myself to slip into it. Does that make sense? It was just the absence of anything to rein me in. It was like, I can do whatever I want. And at the minute, it's to sit in my pants and drink whiskey. And I just slipped into it. Were you suicidal? though? I had a couple of, they they put me in a, in old money. So everyone knows what I'm talking about, a mental hospital. And the the catalyst to put me in there because there's a huge waiting list for this place. You got every addiction in there from drugs, alcohol, smoking, some woman in there smoking 80 to 100 cigarettes a day. A day. Gambling, uh, not just gambling, I mean um, lottery tickets. One lady addicted to buying lottery tickets and all sorts and mental health uh, things. The catalyst to put me there was the suicidal thing. Now, I can't say that when I was absolutely out of it, I wasn't saying, I feel I'm going to end it all, I'm going to do this. Well, I did. I got told by my mother that that happened. But was that from me actually thinking that? Or is it because I'm on my absolute bare bones now of my ass? And you are. When you're that far down, I'm sure you've been there as well. There is obviously things in there saying, I've had enough of this. This is it's too much. What's the point or not? Yeah, definitely. It was like, and you start analysing it. What am I bringing to the party here? Nothing. Not for myself, not for anyone else. I'm useless. I'm a burden on them now. They're looking after me. I was on my mother's sofa for like two months at a time. So it, those sorts are definitely there. Um, would I say that they were there when I was in a sober state? No, I, no not at all. It was when that dr- when that drink, uh, drink was on drugs or anything like that, consumes you it completely consumes you and your thoughts and everything so when i was in the midst of it there was definitely thoughts about it yeah ain't it mad that you were given orders controlling hundreds of people but you couldn't control yourself no, i'm the best at giving advice <laughs> don't do this don't do that but fucking silly oh. bollocks here we'll yeah. do the opposite yeah then it's crazy it's fucking crazy and like i say i i do work for chris's house which is an ambassador for a mental health um 24 mental health place in, up in Wishon, Scotland, and the work that they do is amazing. But when I speak to people, I speak to people who are struggling. I can give the best advice. Mm. But yeah, when I'm struggling myself, yeah. I don't fucking listen to myself. Yeah. I think I'm a fraud, talk shit. Mm. Oh, that's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. See, when you give orders mm. and you lose people by giving orders, how's that feeling? Mm. You got to, you, you definitely got to have a strong mind and be grown up about that because you don't know that what action you're going to take is going to obviously, well, you are a psychopath, if that is the case. It's all about risk, and that is the risk you're looking at. What what is What do I need to achieve, and what's the risk to it? And then, you, like a, a risk assessment in boring terms, you're doing that in your mind the whole time, even if something's happened there and then, which is what you're trained to do in the military, is you plan ahead, but no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So we'd, we'd purposely train to always be analysing and assessing situations. So that is what the risk is. What's the chance of me or someone else getting killed by doing this? And also, what's the chance of us getting killed if we don't do something? So that's the risk. It's like there's a risk for both things. If we're going to do this, well, they, we could get killed. But is there more chance of somebody getting killed if we just not do it? And you've got to make peace with that because people are in that environment going to lose limbs and lose lives. And you are going to question it for the rest of your life, whether you made the right or wrong decision. And that that dilemma came up for me in other ways where I didn't kill someone, an enemy, and I made the decision to capture them. And I think about it now, I'm like, what happens if the Iraqis, uh, no, there's Afghan, that was, what happens if the Iraqis, because the Taliban have it now, so if they locked him up, he's probably free, that dude, we have got to be. What happens if, when he got freed, he went on to commit shitloads more atrocities? Well, that's, I'll never know, 
unless it's a freak instance that somehow he becomes famous for it. So there's the other side of it. Well, now I'm questioning whether I should have taken someone's life. Um, I made a, a, a decision in a different way. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to ponder on. Constant. Hence where we go off and do crazy stuff to not sit there and yeah, there's constant pressure and it's having other people's life in your hands, how their family's going to react, their wives, their kids, and mm. that's just so much pressure. It's, it's got mm. to be the biggest pressures in the world. There can't there can't be another job yeah. that tops that. There's, mm. It's just constant yeah. of and somebody it, has to do it. Listen, people have signed up for it. We understand it. If you sign up and people are fighting in mm. combat, by all means, mm. it's a free game. But mm. and it, it doesn't. But as human beings, though, the brain doesn't switch yeah. off that way. It doesn't matter how no. tough you think you are, how yeah. much alcohol, drugs you take. Yeah. If the brain doesn't never, switch off, it can never, never switch off. And that's my understanding mm. of interviewing yeah. enough people who have been in battle. And mm. uh, yeah, no matter. And they, they say the exact same. It's just trying to, mm. no, it's not just, you, it's like justifying. It's like mm. trying to make it soothe the pain, mm. but it doesn't, does it? Yeah. And it happened with me looking at it at somebody else in that way as well. Somebody else had said something and some blame was getting directed towards them. And I had to look at it in the way of look at myself and how I think about it. So this instance, we were getting sent Afghanistan 2011. We were getting sent down to a village which no allied forces had been in for 18 months. Right? In, in Helmand province, nobody had been there for 18 months. This It was like making the bombs just a no-go zone. We were going down and we were going in there for two days and we were going to smash the place in vehicles and then on, on foot. And before we left, the intelligence officer gave us, as they always do, gives the intelligence brief. This is what to expect. This is what we think they're doing. This is what they've got and what they, their likely actions are. And I remember one of his sayings was, uh, they simply won't shoot at you. You will not uh, get small arms fire, which is somebody with a weapon shooting bullets at you. They're going to plant bombs. They're going to try and take you out that way. And he said, they simply won't take you on with small arms. I threw away that comment as soon as he said it. Because how does he know that? He's an intelligence officer for one. He doesn't even go out and get shot at. So the moment somebody who doesn't go out and get shot at tells you something about getting shot at, you're like, whatever, mate. He didn't listen to a word he's saying. So I discounted it. We went down there and one of our US Marine officers got shot in the head and killed on the second day. So we get back to camp afterwards. After the second day, we drove back up, had the actor after action review. And of course, now people are wanting to point a finger. Well, he said nobody was going to shoot at us, but they did, and someone got killed. And I was like, well, hang on a minute, lads. Did any of you actually listen to that? Because I didn't. And the first day we were there, as soon as we got into that village, they started shooting at us, and they didn't stop for two days. So I not only did I discount it when we left that camp after the brief, I discounted it the moment somebody did shoot at me the day before what somebody got killed. So the way I'd look at it was like, well, he didn't know, know for sure. I do believe he shouldn't have said that because what he should The problem with the intelligence gang is that they need to be seen to be knowledgeable. So he's got to say something. He can't just go out and go, no idea, lads. They might shoot to you, they might not. But he should have. He should have come out and just gone, no, it's been there for 18 months, lads. We have no idea what they're going to do. But he said that, and he came in, and, uh, and he, he, he was broken. And he wasn't like uh, like us, who were prepared for decisions to to impact people. He, he didn't live in that world. He was a bit more sheltered, and he was broken. And I actually said, I don't blame you at all, mate. I said, because we didn't listen to that, and you aren't accountable for it. So there's other ways of looking at at that as well what was it like to kill someone you generally don't get time to think about it at the time you, well you definitely don't get time uh, unless you're a sniper of course and even in those instances you don't get a lot of time unless it's a premeditated uh, rollout it's it's quick and it's easy and it's hard to to give one sort of definitive answer to that because and also what's it like to get shot at because no two instances are the same. You'll never kill, generally, the, a person the same way that you killed someone else. And you'll never be involved in a firefight exactly the same way 
as you were before. They'll always be slightly different. You could, in one instance of being shot at, you could be in control. You could be overwatching someone in control of the situation. They've had a pot shot. You could be in the shit, legging it, and you're taking rounds. Uh, explosion could have gone off. There's chaos and panic all around you. You don't know what's going on. So it's always different. But to take one example of when we got investigated for murder, so people did die, it was it was instinct, and there was a lot of protocol involved as well. I didn't just pull the trigger because I, I was going to kill someone. There's a very quick weighing up in your mind of, is this the right thing to do? Should I be doing this now? What are the, the other dangers and implications of it? In the immediate aftermath, me personally, everyone's different, didn't dwell on it. Now, years and years later, you do think about it, of course, and it's a life taken. Nothing's ever going to change that. You've just got to try and make peace with whether it was the right or the wrong decision. That one in particular, I will never know if it was 100% justified as in who they were. It was 100% justified legally, because we got investigated and it was obviously that would be sat here uh, if it was deemed that it wasn't legal. But we'll never know. We thought and believed that he was a terrorist or they were terrorists and their actions towards us, we warned them a couple of times. It didn't heed them and we took action. So you'll always, I think, ponder unless it's a, it's a cut and dry yeah, but unless you've lived that life, it's hard to then make those choices. I've had snipers on that's had to kill a a, a, a woman and a child because mm -hmm. they were told to go back. And uh, listen, they had a suicide vest on, and there was who did an interview where they tried to tell someone to go back, they wouldn't or they couldn't. They were trying to point to a sign, but they end up killing the kid, and he was innocent. He just couldn't. He just didn't understand English, mm -hmm. and. Uh, in that war zone, listen, you, unless you've lived it, you can't call those yeah. those shots of life or death situations or you're going to back to your family, you're going to take a life. Mm. Like I said, these are the toughest decisions I believe any human can make. And mm. it's just a sad state of affairs where human beings were there in war zones. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's uh, in a, an amazing world, life would be at peace and everyone would be free. It's not. I believe it's getting worse. I believe we're coming up for a World War Three if we're not already in one. It's uh, it's sad times for, for humans. It's sad yeah. times for the world. And mm. I just, I genuinely believe there will be another World War. I believe it's coming, man. It just feels different. The UK feels different. I don't know if the UK is still a force. The British Army, I believe, has still got to be the strongest in the world. That's still got to be up there. Obviously, yeah. we've not got the the numbers of Russia's and China's and other nations, but why is the British so ruthless? Why are we the, the SES, the Marines, SPS, why are, is that the training? Is, is that the mindset? What makes yeah. the British different? Both. And probably helps that we live on a island in the North Atlantic where it pisses down for Every day. 11 months of the year. <laughs> and it, which I think with British people in general, we get a good work ethic from that. Whereas, Think about it. If you lived in the Caribbean, what would you want to do every day? Well, lay on the beach drinking rum. Smoking joints. Smoking joints, <laughs> yeah. Chasing women, yeah. driving boats. Um, There's water as you go. Uh, yeah, cheers, man. So I, I think British people in general have got a good work ethic about them because, because of that. And I think our forces, well, it's just generational, isn't it? We've, we've been at war forever. As it, it, the, British, the British Army, British, the UK with each other before we started taking over the world with an yeah. empire we were at war and it's the same as anything we, we've developed that history in it and mastered it we've had all the losses all the the victories and merged it together and then that's what builds then the training and the mindset you can't just suddenly turn around and go we're going to train our guys to be the best in the world with the best mindset it's just it's got to come through the generations when you look at a lot of Africa and the Middle East now, they're small training teams. So in Saudi Qatar, um, had a sort of a job offer before COVID uh, knocked it out of the park, ready for the Qatar World Cup. Because they wanted to get their country ready for the biggest event on earth. And they, they've never been at war with anyone. 
the the police is pretty tame country, I think. No experience in it. They're like, well, there's potentially terrorist attacks and violent disorder. Right? A lot of yobs coming from England and Wales. We qualified for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and who do they turn to to train their guys? The British. Not so much the Americans, because everyone hates the Americans in that part of the world. So, and it would look bad if their neighbours are like, why have you got the Americans? Are they invading us next? So we got that reputation. And then that breeds the confidence. I mean, the British Armed Forces, that we project probably a lot more than we are brilliant. But we probably project that we're even more brilliant than we are. So that is a part of it. And then we've got to live up to it. Well, we're saying we're the best. right? We're, we're cross-training with the Yanks now. Well, we've got to show them we're the best. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of things have built through through the years and the mindset and experience that have built us up to, yeah. to that point. Because like you say, every, the Scottish and English, the Wales, everybody fought against each other. Yeah. Now, the British did colonise so many countries, over 90% of the world they invaded. Mm -hmm. Like, it's such a strong force, but could that come back and bite them in the ass? Could we become under attack ourselves because of what we've done over the last few hundred years, thousands of years, where it is a possibility um, that we could become weak and all these other countries seem to be getting a little stronger money talks as yeah. well. Um, could we become a target for, to get invaded? Yeah, it's dangerous because the reason we we still, even though these countries we invaded and colonised, are still on our side is because we're a powerful country. Because we got nuclear weapons and the, the people who cry to get rid of oh get rid of our nuclear weapons it'll set an example everyone else will get rid of them what world are you living in no no chance they'll just be like boom there's another weaker target they ain't got nuclear weapons we don't want them because we want to use them we want want them to stop people using them against us and i think yeah the reason these countries are still allied to us, even though we caused them harm over the years, is because we're powerful. And you want to, don't you? Even if you don't like the pow most powerful person in your organization, you still got to have a relationship with them. You've still got to ally yourself with them on in certain areas. And there is a danger if we allow a lot of sort of more liberal, although I don't like to use that word because I see myself as a liberal, but not anymore with how far it's gone to the left. And if we lot, let a lot of these weaknesses, we call it, sort of weak policies and weak out, outlook and projection in the world, then we are going to become a target. There's already countries looking at us with what's been going on here in the, probably the last 10 years, PC culture, things like that. The USA are laughing at us. So if we keep getting weaker in that respect, we're 100% a target. What's the worst thing you've seen in war? There's, is the, the classic answer to that is that everyone would expect is a leg missing, a face shot off, and horrific injuries, blast injuries, everything all over the floor and, every, and total chaos around. So those, you can put them in, in one box and categorize that as looking at actual things, they would be the worst. But there's a lot of other things that I've seen which would, would that bring more emotion into it. Um, we used to go to the American hospital to to help out when I was in Baghdad, help out, chat to the American nurses, uh, <laughs> of course, to flirt with them. And I just remember we'd be sat there and a massive boom would go off in the city and like really bone rattling. It's miles away, but it's still shaking. And you're thinking... For that to be shaking us, and it's clearly a long way away, that's got to be a big one. A few minutes later, a helicopter would land, and they'd be rushing the casualties in. And you'd be stood there watching from US troops to civilians, women and children, just, just getting rushed in. And then everyone just, we'd be in there in, in the rooms with them. We weren't allowed to help with American troops. That was their policy. But we could help with locals. And then watching... The young boy screaming in pain uh, and agony from this blast. So that was not just hard to look at, like the things you see in combat, but it's there and it's horrendous. You got the emotional side of it to contemplate. 
Um, and then other things like we were on a, a checkpoint on my first Afghan. We were in the middle of the desert and this vehicle came up to us with some Iraqi elders. They came up and really friendly to us. And they had this little girl. I got photos of her ginger hair and blue eyes. It must be legacy from the Russian, uh, the Russian invasion in the eighties. And they were trying to get us to give her medicine. And we like, we're not doctors or anything. We can't. And he was just pleading with us to give her medicine. We gave her some like fruit pooches and, and what we had. And she was just malnourished and she was dying. And we knew we, there's nothing we could do about this. You wanted medicine. You wanted help for us, but it's like, we, there's nothing we can do. And this young girl is probably already too late for her. It's malnourished so much. And that would affect me a lot more than seeing, seeing something blown off. Mm -hmm. uh, like that. Now we've got the kind of immigration kind of issue, and like I say, you when you speak about this stuff, you are labelled a racist or right wing or mm -hmm. whatever. Like I'm not asked. That's just that is a massive problem. You can't skip round it. And um, I'm all for refugees. Like I say, British, you're a British soldier, Americans. We've caused so much fucking destruction, if we're honest. So people yeah. want to come away from a war zone and and have a better life for their family. By all means, open mm -hmm. the borders for anybody. In a perfect life, there's no borders, we're under the same roof, blah, blah, blah. But um, refugees, families, give them a better life. Of course, people don't deserve to see that, women and children, anybody. Nobody yeah. deserves to see it, but it, it is what it is. And But when you've got young kids, early 20s, coming over in boats and mm. killing women and killing kids, raping kids, raping women, what's happening in Ireland and England and... It's just fucking madness. Like Twitter over the last couple of months has been chaotic. I try and delete the app, mm -hmm. but I want to go back on it because I need to know what's happened. It's mm -hmm. my job as well to find out yeah. current situations. And it's hard not to get caught up in it. I'm a father. Um, and like I say, I travel the world, but I've got my passport. People know my convictions on my passport and they know what I'm about. I'm I'm there, I'm trying to do good, maybe mm. find work, I'm spending money there. Mm. But when you've got people coming into your borders with no passport, mm. criminal convictions, like something's not right. Something's there's got to be things in place to then protect your own. The UK is, I mm. believe, since my forty years on the planet, it's the weakest it's ever been. Um and I could be wrong, but it's just the things I see. It just seems as if things could really get fucking worse things could with the riots listen it's divide and conquer as well it's easy to divide everyone and forget who the real enemy is yeah but people are, have had enough and like when you people are getting to the streets and protesting it's a great thing because it can create change but the riots don't do anyone any justice and it doesn't create change but what's your whole opinion on it so agreed first and foremost if somebody's a gen genuine refugee and they're in the shit and they need to escape, we got to help them uh, if we can. And it's not going to adversely affect massively ourselves. What I think we need to do with the, the migrant, immigrant, refugee situation, whatever you want to call it, it's that situation, is take the emotion out of it because that's what's ruining the conversation about it. Because as you said, you go... We need to stop them coming over in these boats. These young men with no passports, no paperwork, blah, 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 racist. Right? Well, that's stopping any argument about why you want that to happen or why it is happening. And the same as people say, oh, no, I want them to come over. Oh, you're just a far left idiot. All right. So just take the emotion out of it. No matter what your view is on who they are or where they've come from, where and the rest of it and look at it as you said in practical terms who are they why are they coming here who's facilitating them because these are all criminal acts so whether people are eligible to come here or not you need to know is it legal because you can't just let people break the law like the riots did they let people go and smash stuff up or because no they broke the law it doesn't matter what their background is clearly because they're jailing them all they broke the law, they go to jail. Well, why doesn't that rule apply there? Not go to jail, but why aren't we allowed to say we don't want this situation to happen because it's against the law? I got a young daughter in the States. I'd love to go and live there. And I might at some point. But to do that, I'll have to apply to all the correct visas like yourself. When you go somewhere, you, you check in with your passport. They aren't doing that. 
So to get the argument, get the conversation to come in, you've got to take the emotion out of it. Where if someone says that they don't want it to happen, you just label them as a racist and the opposite. Chat about it. What what are the implications of them all coming over? And we went to these camps and we spoke to a lot of the people and a lot of people say this, and unfortunately because they haven't been there, they get shut down in an argument about it, is they are all young men. A lot of them are coming from places where there aren't wars that they're fleeing from. Like, okay, places, some place in Africa, yeah, they're pretty volatile places and you probably wouldn't want to live there. But they're not, it's not like Syria when, a few years ago when, it, I mean, they were gassing them and the bombs going off everywhere. So what we've got to make the distinction of, uh, what we've got to make the distinction between is refugees and migrants. And you're not allowed to do that at the minute because you'd have the, the Refugees Welcome Brigade. They don't mean refugees. They mean everyone on the boats that wants to come here. We met organizations within the camps uh ngos non-government organizations who were facilitating them coming across well that's illegal why if you're in france a lot of people love to live in france very modern uh, set up country and but your end goal is you've say wales got invaded right and there's a massive war going on i wanted to get out of here with my family. I managed to get out of there and I land in Ireland. All right. I'll be like, thank God for that. I'm safe. Let's take stock. Let's chill out. I'm safe from that hellhole. And I'll work out what I want to do with the rest of my life. Because if you're 23, you've got a lot of time left to get your end goal. I wouldn't immediately go, yeah, I'm safe. Happy days. My fancy bit of Iceland which is what is happening. And I probably wouldn't have had the money when I landed in Ireland to pay someone 20 grand to get to Iceland on a boat. So that's where you got to break it down between other refugees or are they paying an industry to get them somewhere illegally? But you just got to look at the stats. Look at what's happened in Sweden. Their rape cases have doubled within the next tip within the last 10 years and over 70% of the rapes have come from immigrants. Mm. Like that's not, and I'm not saying every immigrant's bad. Yeah. Uh, same as like anything, you've kind of got to cover your ass from what you're saying because you're going to get labelled and that's fucking fine. I, I try and speak mm. the way I want to speak but I'm not, I understand that I give everybody freedom, I want everybody to be happy mm. but there's concerns of what's happening in Ireland, England, unless in Scotland's 97%, 98% a white country. Mm. Um, I'm Scottish through and through, fucking love my country, do anything for them. But I work half the year in England as well. Do you know what I'm mm. saying? With all my English brothers and sisters, mm. and I love that. I love Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales. These are, this is my bread and butter, my work, people who watch my stuff. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So you're not a bad person for trying to protect your kids. A lot of yeah. people go to these marches, want to protect their kids mm. because there is a concern of what's happening in the mm. streets. Taxpayers' money, people who work fucking hard to pay tax for then paying people's hotels and on job seekers like that ain't normal the UK is in critical condition with mental health through the rise addiction through the rise homelessness on the rise something's got to change and it feels as if the government give, don't give two fucks they mm. love it they're lapping it up they're promoting it on the news mm. and I think we need to stop bringing religion into it mm. because I stay in Dubai also mm. Muslim country unbelievable country 0% crime rate, food's amazing, people are amazing. So you can't class somebody of, well, it's because they're Muslim or they're doing that. First of all, it's not a race anyway, religion. But unless you've been to Dubai, you understand how that operates there and how safe that is there. So you can't be blaming people. If you're bad, you're bad. Mm -hmm. I think we're using colour and religion too much. And I think it fuels even yeah. more hatred. That's just the way I see it. Um, it also like, creates an argument for the other side yeah. then so you're only against immigration because yeah. you're racist yeah. so. it's divido and you can't have an opinion but for fuck me look, protect your own first if people mm. we get this place strong by all means bring people over who want to help and who want to provide and do well but it just doesn't seem 
I don't know. It just seems weird. I don't. Is there any else behind that? Mm. That why there's so many people coming across the borders? Is mm. it, what's the? Yeah, and the problem is, unmit like you said, we don't mind people coming to the country, obviously, but unmitigated migration where you're just not checking people. Mm -hmm. Like people who come across, they've got no papers. A lot of them discard them on the way, on purpose, so that when they get here, they can in invent who they are and where they've come from and what problems they had. You can't do any background checks then. I didn't even know your name. Yeah. So the problem is not people coming here. It's we don't know who they are, what their intentions are. Are they coming here just to because they want to live with their sister in Newcastle, or they come in here to be part of an underground, going to work in the car washes, part of the money laundering, part of the um, human trafficking, the sla modern day slavery. And is, I don't know, is there powers out there that, that want? Are they helping, for, I don't know, just think of a, a country who hates us off the top of the head, go in, right, let's get a load of money into these countries. Let's get a lot of people who hate the UK and want to go there and cause crime and destruction. And we will pay the traffickers to get them there because we want to see the demise of the UK. Obviously, I'm just No, but it's a possibility. I know people can call you a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. These are possibilities. Yeah, it does. Boats it's and one boats possibility. and boats and boats that is it potentially enemies sending them here to then mm. cause destruction and pain? Mm. Because the way it's going, that's potentially the way it fucking looks. And it's mm. not... And like I say, you need to be careful what you say because you're labelled, I'm not anything, I don't give a fuck who you are. I wouldn't have you anybody, speak to anybody if mm. I believe they deserve a chance to speak as well. But it's just it's just madness what's going on. And I don't know if social media, that brainwashes you because it makes the world a whole. And yeah. people are getting prison sentences now, three years for um resharing tweets and facebook posts like that's madness i seen a mm. fucking pedophile raped a three-year-old in community service like how the fuck what the fuck is going on like mm. that boils my fucking blood i don't understand that mm. myself i don't understand it but yet you mm. speak out against that you're a bad person yeah. how the fuck can you be bad the olympics yeah. was just a fuck gay pride was a month before but the opening ceremony in the olympics <laughs> you've got fucking drag queens and transgender and they're, they're mocking Christianity. I'm not mm. a religious man, but you can't mm. be fucking doing that mm. with the biggest religion in the world. Yeah. And, and yet you've it. got a pedophile, who, a 19-year-old raped a 12-year-old, but yet he's playing at the Olympics. Mm. You've got the kid in the boxing, understanding he's born with female parts. I, I don't really know. I think it's all changed with yeah. the boxer. But if you've got chromosomes X, Y, you're up genetics of a man. You've got the yeah. speed of a man, the strength of a man, the looks of a man. And yes, you get intersex where you're born with both parts. I understand that. But he just looked like a man. And I could be wrong. People did give me shit for it. I did <laughs> post about it. But I'm not backing down from it. He yeah. was banned from the World Championships for yeah. that reason of having XY chromosomes. Yeah. I mean, he should if not been be been banned already yeah. for it, then there's something in it. He shouldn't be competing against one. But then you look at the president of France. Um, is it the president or the mayor? It's weird how it works next. you got, yeah, the... Prime Minister, Tran and Prime Minister, who was a trans transgender, I think a man turned to a woman. He's got the boyfriend. It's fucking all queer, and mm. that's and I've got friends and all. Again, you're a homophobe, but mm. why does that shit at the start of the Olympics? That should mm. not be there. Yeah. You've got people working yeah. their whole life to showcase their talents, who have sacrificed four fucking years to then get took away by dancing fucking yeah. drag Side queens. Show. Yeah, but why? Pride mm. Month was last month, do that shit yeah. last month. Let's showcase the talents yeah. of the, the Olympians. Mm. It's a sport. Mm. But again, we're being brainwashed to normalise this madness. They don't mm. want the family life. They don't they want the broken homes. They want everything because then your mm. ease are controlled the way I see it. But the Olympics was a fucking joke. Mm. And it takes the light away from these amazing athletes who train their whole life to showcase their talents. Like mm. I say, with the boxing thing, stand by what I says. I don't give a fuck what anybody says <laughs> that he should not be competing against women he's got yeah. XY chromosomes you get genetics of a man the speed the power everything so it just seems yeah it just seems fucking weird and I can only speak and I could get it wrong as well so and if people are upset by all means I don't, I don't fucking care but yeah. um, it's yeah. just crazy the and I love listening to you and, and other people because I'm not massive on everything like all that that stuff, I, I, I keep an eye on it, but I love to listen to all the different views in it. 
because a lot of things you said there, I'm like, actually, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know the French prime minister that was <laughs> yeah. transgender or whatever. Transgender. Yeah. It's, um, and that's what you need it, to do with those arguments is take that emotion of, oh, I'm on this side. Therefore, if you disagree with me, you're racist. Yeah. You're like, well, i tell you what sh really shown opened my eyes to that as well was I put that video out last week and I thought it'll get a bit of attention because it's topical. Mm -hmm. And I got people walking in my business, shaking my hand, going, that was amazing. And I think they like it because I, I didn't go on then rant about it. I didn't go, right, blah, blah, blah. I just said it, facts as they were. And the amount of people then who watch that video, and I'm like, well, I'm sure 170,000 racists haven't just watched that video because they're racist. They, there's 170,000 people who are interested in this subject yeah. for a whole lot more reasons than being racist or whatever you want to call them. And, that, and that's a fraction of how many people would be interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, the GB News interviews got nearly a million views now. Yeah. So are you saying all those million people who... I'd say the majority of them, judging by the comments as well, have been, yes, I'm interested in this because it is an issue. You can't just call all them racists. or And even if you are going to call them racists, what you should be doing, and it's the problem we get they don't do, is looking at, even if they are racists, why are they concerned about this? Leave the, the racism part out of it. Why, why are so many people showing interest in it? Even if they're not being that voiceful about it they're still watching it they're still going well hang on a minute and a lot of people said to me people who who are labor councillors from where i'm from have messaged me and gone actually i was quite surprised with what you said there and it does make sense so a lot of people are looking at it from that neutral point and who maybe not so polarized as the far as far on the left or as far on the right who sat in the middle going, yeah, actually, we do need to pay a bit yeah. more attention to this. But the majority of people in life, straight, bi, trans, black, white, green, purple, whoever, the majority of people just want to go through their life mm. and don't care. They just want to just go on with their life. And mm. I'm not targeting gay people, trans people, immigrants. I'm just looking at from a father. I just don't want, there's a guy with his bollocks out on the opening ceremony in the Olympics. I don't want my fucking daughter seeing that creepy shit. Yeah. Keep it behind closed yeah. doors. Keep it over 18. Mm. They're just trying to force a lot of stuff onto people to normalise the madness. And I guess a good analogy to that would be the Royal Marines. And it's a perfect analogy for similar to you said there. There's a saying in the Royal Marines that there's only one colour that matters, and that's green. The green beret you wear. If you've got that, if you've earned it, I don't care where you're from, what language you speak. You yeah. have to speak English in some form. What your sexuality is, because that's open now to everyone. What Where you grew up, colour your skin, none of it matters. You've got a green lid. I only judge you on how you perform in that green lid. If you're a shit marine, I'll judge you on being a shit marine, not on where you've come from or who you are. So that's a, a massive saying in the Marines. And that, that example, again, if... If we had our Royal Marines, we all got green berets. We all just want to get on with being a Marine. Like you said, people want to get on with their lives. They'll get on if you've all got the same beliefs, the same um, values. If the Royal Marines then started going, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to let a lot of these um, yellow buried people in who haven't done what we've done and they haven't got the same mindset. They haven't got the same values. We're going to start just letting them come and join the Marines. Everybody in the Marines who, like you said, in life is we all want to live under the same banner and get on, would we'll be mm. like, well, hang on a minute. This this is going to ruin what we've got, our dynamic, our UK island of values and strengths. You can let all these in. It, they're not as, they haven't got the same values. They haven't done the same training. They haven't got the same fitness levels. They haven't got the same mindset. They're not going to be able to perform or live in the Marines the same way we live. No. And or they even they're not saying no, they're gonna go, all right, why are we doing this and should we be should we be doing it? It's the big question. And what's gonna be the impact if we do? Yeah. It's gonna change the dynamic of what we've worked so hard to build. It's just people are scared to speak out and, and that's why these conversations are your like documentary sort of things. People will sit in the fence and just watch it. They'll mm -hmm. not give an opinion yeah. because they're scared to look and people do lose their job. People are getting mm -hmm. put in prison. Oh. And it's ridiculous. Not, you don't, it's, listen if you're causing violence and want to 
hand people yeah. and burn down fucking 100%. hostels. Like, come on, that is too far. That's yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah. That's lunatic stuff. Not but, an opinion. Though, yeah, yeah, that's not an opinion. Um, so I do understand that part of it, but that just seems where we're at, where people are angry and they feel as if violence is the answer, but it's clearly not. But yeah. The problem with, problem with the uh, people getting fired for the opinions is the ones that apologise for it. Mm -hmm. You're just making it worse for everyone who's going to come afterwards now because they're going to go, well, all the rest of the people apologise for it. So that means it's wrong. You're like, well, no. So it's a lot of... Yeah, no, you've got to stand tall. Even when I posted about that uh, boxer, people were saying, apologise. I ain't fucking apologising. I stand on what I believe. I don't yeah. feel as if he should be fighting against yeah. women with the chromosomes. Yeah. The undercover immigrant, though, how did that idea come about? Mm. So we started Tramp Face, uh, which is one of my goal vent ventures of occupying myself in between the gaps in the Marines. Me and Paul, we started every year. We, for a week of our annual leave, go and live with the first one. Let's go and live homeless for a week. And we wanted to do it. You did your ones brilliant as well. A little bit different. Yours is quite serious and well documented. We basically just got on the piss for a week <laughs> without <laughs> without going home. <laughs> a week party. Yeah. But we did it as in we weren't going around telling people that we weren't homeless and we were just playing around. Dressed gruffly, told people we were ex-forces who'd been kicked out on the streets. Very believable story. And we wanted to immerse in it because we all walk past someone on the streets every day begging, sleeping. But we don't, what do they do for the rest of the day? We don't know. We're like, well, let's go and find out. How do they get money? How do they get food? How are they treated by people? How do they find somewhere to live? So the idea was, let's go and do it fully immersed for a week. We got a beg. The overriding rule was we can't do anything that a homeless person um, couldn't do. Couldn't use their own money, couldn't get help from other people. So we went, went and did that for a week. Uh, at the end of it, it was great. We raised money for charity. We felt a real connection with it. I, I came off the streets wanting to go back. It was like coming back from war. It was like that was just such a refreshing. It was hard work, obviously, as you know, a tire in. But it, it definitely, I felt a connection with it. Let's do it again next year. So each year we decided to go on up the ante. Because we're like, you can't. We can't just go and do the same thing again next year. People aren't going to give money for that. Like did it last year. You already proved that. Let's and for our own satisfaction, let's just up the ante and go a bit further. So second year, then we did go to our first trip to the migrant camp. We went across to Calais. The goal that year was just to live there for a week and see if we could try and get back on one of the trucks. Didn't. It's got actually quite harder than uh, you thought. Hence why they're now coming across in the boats. Did that third year, we hitchhiked around the UK whilst living homeless. So the same rules, but every day, thumb out, somebody picks us up wherever they were going. We jumped in and went. It's like the first guy, where are you going, lads? Where are you going? Leeds. Leeds it is. Uh, did that for a week. Fourth one, we cycled Swansea to London over five days whilst living homeless. Two nights homeless in London and then ran the London Marathon on the last day after seven days homeless. We had a lull then after that year. We were like, how can we top that? Because it was great. Raised 10 grand for charity. How can we beat this? We have to go homeless on the moon or something. And then the boats came back into the news again. Massively, there'd been a few incidents with it that got high, high level attention. And Paul was like, well, the last time we went there, we didn't achieve our goal of smuggling ourselves back to the UK. He's like, we got to lay this to rest. Let's go back, but let's go via Paris this time. We'll go to a yellow vest protest to see what's going on there. Got gassed by the French police. Got on video. This is my next YouTube video, actually. And then go back to the camp, see how it's changed. And then get across on a dinghy. Right, how are we going to get this dinghy? I'm not going to go and pay the human traffic, actual traffic at 20 grand to get across. So the plan was we'd go there, live for a week, and then our friend from back home would drive over in a van the night before with a deflated dinghy in the back, and he should have got rumbled. 
coming across Dover to France with a dinghy in the back and a small engine, a, a lone bloke on his own. He didn't. Did the van get searched? Van didn't get searched. That's the fucking, that's one of the issues. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He, he could have brought anybody over. Yeah. Oh yeah, a van for starters. You're like, right, he's a van. He, yeah. There's not that many vans going across, I'm sure. Bloke on his own. Let's have a quick look in the back here. Because they he would have they would have stopped him hundred percent if they'd have opened that back door, <laughs> deflated in the engine like no chance, mate. Did they have an excuse if they asked? I don't know actually. I don't know. He probably because he's good. Yeah, he's a bit like you doing. He's got a gift yeah, of the gab yeah, and why yeah. boy. He'd have shit. come up. <laughs> he'd have come up with something to yeah. get out of it. <laughs> how did you then? So when you're with the migrants, because how does two white guys then fit in? Because obviously. Mm. English speaking, how do you fit in with two foreigners without being undercover cop or undercover mm. journalist? How do you get away with yeah. that? This was the issue. When he Paul came up with the idea to go and the first time as well. So the first time I was like, well, what's going to be the story? In the UK, it's easy to be pre pretend to be homeless. How are we going to pull this off? We can't pretend to be on the run from Eritrea, right? Or Syria. The story was, and when he first said it to me, I was like, this is bonkers but actually very believable and probably the only thing that would have been believable. Story was, we joined the French Foreign Legion, which of course then you have your documents taken off your passport, getting your identity in the Legion. We didn't like it. That went for us. We jumped the wall, wandered out of the Legion, but because we haven't got any documents, we want to get back to the UK. Well, we can't travel now legally because we can't prove who we are so we're making our way back towards the border trying to get word to the uk government of who we are until they can process it send some sort of documentation for us to get back across so until that time period we're living homeless uh on North, on in the camps in northern france uh until we get that and we didn't only roll that out to the migrants that we were living with because we went and lived in their camp slept in the tents with them slept on a church doorstep with a lot of syrian guys but also, there's a lot of people in these camps, officials, reporters, police, all the, the charity and NGO agencies. Like, we're going to keep up, we're going to have to keep up the pretense to them as well. <laughs> so we were rolling the story out to them as well, and they believed it. Silly bastards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would have happened, though, if they didn't, if they had suspicion that you were police, could your life be in danger? I mean, they did. They did have suspicion. Some people just directly said to us i don't believe mostly the ngos believe it or not were very suspicious towards us the migrants i mean even if we were undercover what well, apart from getting where they're going to get facilitated what are we going to get off them when they're just sat around in the camp nothing because they're not really doing anything at that point but a lot of the people who wanted to help them they their their levels were up like all oh, these guys, they're suspicious and we don't trust them. And we, they didn't want us interfering in the help they're giving them to get across the channel. Because a lot of agencies out there, their goal is to overtly help migrants to get across the channel. There's one called No Borders. And their, their mission statement is, we believe there should be no borders in the world and we will help everybody go wherever they want. And these people are in the camp. They, they provide them information. They provide the connections and they actually smuggle them as well. It, we didn't see this in person, but conversations of other people in the camp, they put them in their cars and take them across. So these organizations were very suspicious of us. We did employ a couple of countermeasures, Paul and I being military, whereas if we thought the occupants were being a bit suspicious towards us, because this was serious. I was still serving in the Royal Marines at the time. If they'd got wind of who I was, somehow, because we were, we did the first one, we did say on Facebook where we were going. We had the charity page for it. Then they're from Syria and these countries. They're going to have an easy access to terrorist organizations. That's a very simple phone call. Is a British Royal Marine sleeping in our camp tonight? How much do you want for us to hand him over or whatever? The deal so it was really serious situation that we had to be uh on our guard about so every now and again we'd put in some countermeasures paul would say oh, i'm hungry i'm going to go and get something from the supermarket 
he'd go off, obviously be watching if somebody was following him. I'd be watching the camp to see if someone did leave. Someone would. A couple of minutes later, they'd have a phone call or cause they all got phones. And then when he got back later that night, when we were home, we'd have a conversation. He was like, oh yeah, Assad was, I saw him when I come out of the, the supermarket or whatever. So we had to be on our guard as well when conversations were breaking out in languages that we didn't speak. And they were getting quite heated. And we're like, well, are they arguing about us? I think think they're talking about us and one of them's not happy with us being here. So there was a lot of tension at all times for our, for our own safety. So see, because they're there, are they basically trying to get to the UK or they're living there? Surely, they, why is it no, not? They're getting to the UK. But if people know that, then why is people not and do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Just, and this is that's the question. How many people were there? Well, on the first trip, two thousand people. In two thousand. So this yeah. was called the Cali Jungles, that correct? But it, it stopped was, in 2016, it, 2017. Moved, we the first trip, they actually cleared out the original jungle. It was a woodland near a gymnasium. But it wasn't just that. That was just one small woodland. There was so there was a camp in the dune area, there, and then there was just small satellite camps everywhere. One by church, which we slept with with the guys. A lot of people look at it and they think there's one big camp there and they're all singing songs on the campfire and they're all friends and mates and, and united in their goal there across the channel. There's not. There's camp from Eritrea, camp from Syria, camp from Afghanistan, camp from Sudan. All these different satellite camps and they don't like each other. They're not working together. They're all competing because, they, as you said, they're not there to live in that camp for the rest of their lives. The goal is to get across the channel. And with the second trip there, we went to Paris as well, and we saw staging post in Paris. We went to one on the outskirts called Paul La Chapelle is the area. And we spoke to people again, we just went up, they were on fires, chatting with them, and they were getting their food handouts. Some, what's the score, lads? We, why, and not just as reporters, just hanging around first. Don't ask, not asking direct questions, just chatting with them. And eventually the stories would come out. The one in Paris was a staging post. They they had no intention of staying in Paris either, but they'd come from Southern Europe. And of course, same as any movement or migration, you can't you don't do it in one fell swoop if it's over that distance. So Paris was a staging post. We're here, we're here to stay, take stock, meet up with the next agent or facilitator, and then move on to Northern France. So all the ones in that camp, at the time, 2,000 of them. Their goal was to get across the channel. A lot of them, they end up there for months and months. They run out of money, run out of options, and then they do hand themselves in. But it's a good question. Is like, why isn't somebody going in and yeah, doing something about yeah. it? They just left there. The, the French police will just, they just sit on the outskirts of the camps. They don't go, they don't go in there on a daily basis. Are they happy for them to leave France though and go to the UK? Well, are, are they being pushed yeah. towards the UK in a way? That's one question and it's got to be a big Suspicion, isn't it? Why aren't they going into the camps to do something? Are they just happy for them to be off their doorstep? They're not our problem anymore. They're going across the channel. Why don't they do more to stop them on the beat launching? Because you look at, go on Google Maps and look where we launched to come across the channel. We, we surveyed it from Google Maps. We didn't go there and look at where we were launching. We were like in the camps going, right, where are we going to go from? We went on maps. There was one obvious prominent slipway in to the channel closest to the camp. Well, that's the easiest one to get to. And it's the closest actual route then to Southern England. So it's not hard to work out certain launch points. And I think that on myself, I'm like, why, how are they still able to launch? They surely exhausted all the secret places that they've got because it's been going on for over a decade. Why aren't these places, you don't have to have somebody stood there, you can set up a camera, a live CCTV camera, wired back into the local police station. Two guys who just turned up with a, with a fast boat and there's another 50 guys on their way. Right, let's get down there and, and nick them. Was there any women or kids in these camps? So two, and one of them had a, a baby with her. So I don't think she was living in there, but out of the couple of thousand men, that was it. They weren't, they weren't women in there. Was there any fights? Yeah, the Kurdish and the Syrians hated each other. 
so they'd they'd be fighting during the day it was really benign there's loads of people walking around there in the day medical staff and the other people i mentioned they're all drinking in the camps and i got photos and videos of the mess of these and i sat around the campfire with them drinking and in any environment where you put a lot of young men darkness comes in they're all having a few beers there's drugs as well we definitely saw the evidence of drug taking things are going to spill over and there would be arguments fights between the camps paul and i would then if it happened when we were there extract ourselves because we don't want to be stuck in the middle of this um but it surprised a lot of people because they think it's just one big harmonious camp they're all mates and together and it's the opposite they're all fighting with each other and in competition this is the issue though young men drinking it's not women and children mm. like you say as refugees who are want a safer life which is understandable these are young men mm. drinking fighting with each other mm. all get knives do you know what i mean all tooled up mm. so and coming into the borders you don't know what they're capable of mm. and uh this is a concerning thing with mm. most people are just concerned of the safety of the family yeah. and that's and rightly so yeah it's and just what you got to be concerned about as well is how organized it is because again a lot of people probably wouldn't realize this they think oh they've just struggled and whatever to get to northern france and they're well funded a lot of guys well dressed and again we got photos of them mobile phones and there's economies in these camps there were little convenience stores built up, built with like crates, the little flag on top. When we go to the Aldi or Lidl, Paul and me, to get our few cans of lager, because we, we were Dutch courage and to blend in with them. They're like, would, would a couple of undercover guys be sat here having a couple of beers with us? They'd be there with trolleys, stacked high, full of cans of lager. A couple of guys. They're like, well, he's not buying that for himself, is he? A trolley full of beer. They're going back and then selling it to the other guys. And we just, that opened our eyes. We didn't think we were going to see that. We thought we were just going to see people just scrambling to survive, not buying things off each other. Was there any of them coming for a better life, genuinely a better life, or was it just a kamikaze job to come to the UK? There was, and you've got to be, like I like to do, you've got to be honest and look at these without any bias or emotion. And there were guys we spoke to, and you do think, because it does humanise it. When you look at it from afar, it doesn't matter who you are, you're from afar. And when you go there and talk to them, and of course, you, this is the personal interaction then, you do get humanised towards it. And there's a few guys who think, do you know what, you, you're really well spoken and educated, told us that they had qualifications back home. And you're like, you would actually be a benefit to the country in some ways, but you can't do it this way, mate there's a way to do it and there will have been people in these camps that could have come here and got a job and done things correctly but the fact that you're not doing that and you're doing it by devious methods says something on its own so you could really be well educated and you could live a life in our society but also it says something about your character that you're willing to do it illegally yeah they're committing crime so if you're willing to do it in that, in that instance at the start what could that turn into with influence the other end and offers of money you get yeah you can't get a job all right yeah well you can come and do this for your cousin who used to know you back home so yeah i have to be honest and say we did make friends with some of them and you think yeah you you actually seem like a pretty decent guy yeah, but that's But you good. also got a question. Yeah, of course, the method of being an illegal immigrant, no papers, no passport, you're coming into the country with be mm. criminals straight away. Mm. What is the consequences if they get caught, say, on the middle of the ocean? Like, mm. What is the consequences? Where do they go? Are they Are getting took to the UK? Yeah. Are they getting took to France? What's the mm. consequences? It's gone back and forth, because keeping up with it myself for the last few years, there's been instances where I think they were saying... Or oh, the French are now turning them around if they catch them up to a certain point. There's another point where I was saying, but like the French, once they leave, they leave the coast. That's it. They're your problem, whatever they're picked up from. Or if the British border force picked them up, even if it's 100 metres off the French coast, tough. The British have got them. That's their problem. 
and it's an interesting one because I don't actually know what the the law is on it. I think we somebody needs to come out from the government and tell us. Because one minute it's, oh, the French will take them back. The next minute is, oh, no, they won't. Well, what is, is it a human rights law that's stopping us, sending them back if we catch them so far along? Is it a, a, just our own law which prevents it? In which case we could change that. It's our law. I don't actually know what the the official ruling is on it. And it is a mess, isn't it? Because, like I said, it, we'll pick them up and then well, we'll take them all the way. Yeah. The stories of us getting picked up closer to France than the UK, but we bring them across and then they get processed. But it's a lot of the families who are struggling and they're getting put up in the fancy hotels, having their food paid, they've got the mm. best of clothes, the best of technology. Mm. But there's so many people struggling yeah. here. So it made me laugh was that Bibby Stockholm um, you know, the, the prison ship or whatever they called it. I don't think it was a prison ship. Was it? it was an old, mm -hmm. like, oil workers accommodation ship. They called it a prison ship. And you see the pictures of it, that. You're like, you've seen the shittles that I had to live in for 17 years in the Marines. I yeah, know my room as a sergeant, a sergeant in the Royal Marines, in the sergeant's mess, you couldn't drink the tap water. And I'm not making that up. There's a sign on there saying non potable. <laughs> Are you be pissing green? Yeah. To get a glass of water, as a sergeant in the Royal Marines, to get a glass of water, I had to walk all the way down the corridor. I know, oh, first world problems. To the uh, laundry utility room to get a glass of water. And you're thinking, sergeant in the Royal Marines can't drink the water from his own tap. That place was luxury compared to some of the, some of the shittles you stay in, in like the Welsh mountains. I think it was the same down in, they put him in Penali camp, which is down in West Wales. And they kicked off about that. And then the human rights lawyers get involved. And I'm like, why? And then the government cave, of course, as soon as the human rights lawyers get involved. Oh, yeah, okay. okay and they moved them. Yeah, it's good enough for our forces and our troops. Why isn't somebody in the government go standing up and going, we put our Royal Marines in these places, so therefore they're fit for um, for humans. And they, they put one in near Folkestone. I think it might have been Napier Barracks or one of them. And they burnt it down. They, they set fire to it because they didn't like living there. It was an army camp. So it's... What is the numbers, the actual numbers of immigrants coming to the UK? Daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, do you know? No, I don't. I don't. I know there's a report this week said, I think 500 had turned up in one day, which that is staggering. Like we come across on, on one, me and Paul on one boat. So you could say, all right, we slipped through the, dis the defences. You can't really have a go a border force for that, for every single... You can't expect them to catch every single boat. But 500, that seems like there's no defense at all. And they're not coming out and going, oh, oh, 500 got across, but we caught 300. You just hear 500 got across. 500 boats? Yeah, so did what? Did 500? No, 500 people. Did 500 people set off and get and achieve it? Or, yeah, so, I mean, I don't think anybody really knows the numbers because when we... When we came across, we five minutes before we landed, two actual boats had landed, and they'd caught them, but they were trying to run away. So we know about the numbers that are getting caught and processed, but how many boats are hitting? Because a lot of them don't want to be processed. They want to go and live illegally in whatever and work in a car wash, uh, or whatever they do, I don't know. How many are, are getting across, hitting the beach, legging it, uh, that we don't know about? Yeah. Well, we don't know. Obviously. But if you're living illegally somewhere, you can do what the fuck you want. You can do any crime and then fuck mm. back off. Mm. It's scary. And because um, obviously your video is where we see all the rats running about this camp. Yeah. Fucking disgusting. Yeah. And uh, the rubbish. Yeah. It's, and that, uh, that was self. Um, I think I sort of saying in the video, we turned up at this camp. They're all getting fed from the, the charity agencies. And looking at it, just from completely neutral point of view was the attitude they'd get these little foil trails trays with the like chow mein or whatever food the rice they've been given and i'd watch some of them and they'd take a, a few spoonfuls and just throw it on the floor now there were wheelie bins there provided and because the government the council knew this was a camp now so they try as best they can to facilitate it with bins and all the rest of it there were bins everywhere and they just throw it on the floor, like at the rats. It was as if me and Paul made it made a joke. It was like their pets, because they'd have a few spoonfuls and then just discard it. And like I done 
anyone on earth i don't understand that mentality it's like if you're living there why and there's rats everywhere why would you feed the rats is it because it's a staging post and they don't care because they're out of there in maybe in a day or two's time yeah but if they're doing that they'll be doing that anywhere and that's that's one exactly the, the point is when you, you look at someone's behaviors it's if they're doing that there then mm -hmm. that's just the way they are it's not so, a, probably not a one-off that they've that they're just doing that so what was your plan going back then having your friend drive with the dinghy and then finding a location and just bringing the dinghy, dinghy straight back to the uk did you yeah. have to check where did you have to check obviously the dinghy was supported obviously if there's two years in it, if you get a hole in that you're dead yeah but what was what was the plan behind that the uh the plan was pretty chip shop if i'm honest with you Kamikaze. well it was yeah and there was a reason for that as well we didn't want to we didn't want to go across there have some military precision perfectly planned and executed thing to get across because we wanted to prove the point that we could get across with very little behind us if it had been all well set up and everything, we'd have got across, gone, oh, look what we've done. And the answer would have been, yeah, of course you did. You're a Royal Marine. You had this in place. You had that in place. You had support. So it was purposely set up to be not well planned. <laughs> I think, Paul, we would have looked at that. I can't remember purposely doing it, but we would have looked at the weather just out of curiosity even. But it wasn't a case of, oh, if it's doing this, we're going to abort it. We were coming across on that night. All right, if it was a tropical storm and somehow come up from the equator and smashed it we'd have reassessed but it was a case of this is the night we're doing it it wasn't oh we could push it to the side paul had to go back to work i had to go back no i was flying to america to see my daughter the day after i didn't make that flight so it was purposely not well planned nikki came and met us and it was common he's one of the funniest guys i've ever met and we should have known by picking him that it would that it would have ended up like this. He turned up two hours late, obviously. Paul and I had been resting in a cemetery uh, before the off. He turned up two hours late. We jumped in. And he was dressed uh, in a stripy red and white shirt with a big tash and a French beret on for a bit of his grip and a morale after all the time we'd had living in the camp for a week. Where's Wally? Yeah, uh, yeah, like the Where's Wally thing. Brilliant. So I was great, but a morale. Jumped in, he, and he said, right, I've got to find petrol station, lads. All right. Paul was like, this is midnight now in rural France. Paul's like, have you not got enough fuel to get back to the port? It's not that far away, and there's petrol stations everywhere because it's a trucker port. Oh, not for the van, for the boat. Paul said, you haven't brought any fuel for the boat? No, no, I'd, uh, we'll get some now. Where are we going to find a petrol station in rural France this time of night? Found one. So he opens the light door. He's like, right, chuck us the yeah, two tanks. Chuck us the tanks, lads. So Paul goes to hand them to him. He goes, oh, hang on, Nicky. This one's full, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's full of diesel. Uh, Paul's like, all right. The boat engine's diesel, is it? No, petrol. I'm going to pour that one into my van and then fill it up with petrol. So Paul's like, right on, right on. So he fills one up with petrol and then he hasn't got a funnel to pour this. It's just a like a, a, a squat jerry can with a cap. He hasn't got a funnel to pour it into the van. So I had to cut the bottom of my water bottle off, turn it upside down, and Paul's just going this again. He's going up to the woman at the counter going, Are you a funnel? And she's like, well, she speaks French. He's going, le funnel. <laughs> <laughs> so I filled up the van, and Paul's going, right, Nikki, how far will one of these tanks get us? No idea. He said, what, what do you mean, no idea? I thought you were going to take the boat out last weekend to test how far you could get on a tank. Yeah, I didn't have time. Right, oh. If that one runs out in the middle of the ocean, it had, um, it's, it's, there's like a pipe that connects straight to the, the tank. Paul's like, has the other one got the same connection where we can just change the thing over? No, you've got to unconnect it, pour the other tank into that one, and then reconnect it. Suppose like what bobbing around in the English Channel, we're going to be <laughs> trying to pour this petrol tank into the other one. Yeah, so it, it was Paul at this point was just like, I'm going to cancel. Let's just call this off because it was all going wrong. Got to the slipway into the ocean, pitch black, and we had to pump the the dinghy up. 
we had to do it from 12 volt battery from the van and the noise. I got a video of the racket. I mean, it's like a pneumatic drill going off. You're like, how somebody didn't get alerted and come and get us? Well, it says the police in it. They probably would have gone, yeah, don't worry about that. If they did, they get the call. Pumped it up. And then we had to drag it all the way down this beach um, to the shore. Did a little video. We had a blow up doll with us. Um, which Nicky brought with us. So we, we knew he was bringing a blow-up doll, but we didn't know that he'd sell a tipped a face to it. If you remember Only Fools and Horses is the episode where they inadvertently bring back a stowaway from Calais called Gary. So he'd sell a tip Gary's face to this blow-up doll. So he was going to be our, our stowaway for the for the journey. And that was it. Um, got prepared on the slipway. Uh, we didn't even have a bearing for England. We just, like I said, we wanted it to be just loose. It's that direction, north. Let's go. Pumped it up, jumped in with Gary, and uh, off we went, set towards England. How, what's the distance? 22 miles, I think. And how fast does a boat go? I don't know, but it took us four and a half hours. So any mathematicians out there, 22 miles. And we we wouldn't have gone in a straight line either because we didn't have a, a like a bearing. We'd have been, there were ships around the course as well. So we had to avoid swells and avoid. Yeah, what about the Shatton Lane? Because that's one of the busiest in the world. So yeah. How do you, because it's pitch black, they might not have seen you. Pitch, so yeah. how I do mean, you judge that? Do even you? Even in the light, they'd see us a lot sooner, I guess, but they're massive. Are they looking around for little dinghies to, to avoid? They don't care. The big tanker's flying down the English Channel. All it really cares about is the direction it's going. So even if they would have seen us at the last minute, we're tiny in this in these swells, they, they can't change course. And it's probably more dangerous for them to try and do a, a, a hard left or hard right. So it was the onus was on us. We've got to keep a lookout for them. If it's too late, they're not moving and we're not getting away from them. So it was constantly, as soon as we set off, pitch black when we set off. So trying to gauge the lights. And it's hard to gauge the the perception of how far away they were. When we did see a light, we're like, well, how big is that light? Well, if we don't know how big the light is, we can't judge how far away it is either. So it was a few times where it started getting bigger and we're like, shit, that's pretty close now. And we'd have to, it's a lot easier for us to to change direction and change around and we were more concerned about border force boats not for getting in trouble because we we hadn't broken the law we'd broken rules because technically i still haven't left france from from that trip because we flew in on our passports but we didn't check out of course so we'd break we'd broken rules as in we should have checked it checked out of france and we should have checked in with a harbor when we got to the uk we didn't but it was more of a concern of us not being able to do it. It was, we wanted to achieve this this goal. We'd been building up all week for it. So it'd have been a nightmare if we'd set off and half an hour later, the border force had picked us up and, and we'd failed then. So that was that was a big concern as well. 22 miles though. Yeah. It's not that far for people to come through your borders hmm. either. So see when you're getting to the end, were you just more concerned of border patrol when there was none? Yeah. None whatsoever. None. We, the only border, we could, might have seen one in the dark. Of course, we couldn't identify him. But why the fuck would they not do runs of every the half jobs. hour, every hour, mm. just to kind of, yeah. it's like they're, everybody's welcome and mm. it doesn't matter who it is, which mm. is fucking madness because it wouldn't be that expensive to put people on the shores or on boats mm. to just, yeah. it's not a big, it's not a big vicinity to mm. then, Mm. not be looking at like you say cctv pretty basic mm. or uh, something with sensors there must be you must have been on were you been on the radar mm. you must have been yeah. on the radar uh, eh? yeah yeah and uh, like looking from a from a military point of view is if say that was we were at war with somebody could say we are on the coast of northern france and the way they were attacking us was to send boats across if you put the British military in charge of stopping that, that'd get stopped in a day. You'd have reconnaissance teams on the ground watching them. You'd identify where they could. You'd have drones, satellite imagery. You'd get all the intercept their communications. We can do it in Baghdad and, and Helmand province to a massively high level and effect. Very uh, effective and successful at it. So if that was the British military doing it, 
when we're doing it on such a level with global terrorist organizations, that'd be stamped out. But why? Why isn't it? Why isn't it? Is it because we're not coordinating with the French? Is it because the French don't want to coordinate with us? Or whether maybe our government don't want to coordinate with the French? There's got to be something stopping it because if you look at it from the practical point of view, like I've said in the military, that is a very basic operation to identify and stop at its source right there. So how easy would it be to stop the boats? Just like you say there, that's how easy it would be to just drones, military, it can be stopped in a day. Yeah, you'd identify where they're coming from and not just from where they're launching from. That, 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 that logistics route... It goes back a long way, but that I tells mean, you, you look that at Turkey and I mean places like that. As but well. that tells you that nobody wants them stopped. Yeah, it's clear cut evidence that nobody wants them stopped. Someone is benefiting from this, yeah. and like we always say, the, the old divide and conquer. You don't really look at the bigger picture and the real enemy mm. is the ones who are making the money behind that with the destruction, the pain, fighting and arguing and riots. Mm. People are then easy to control. They can then change the laws. Okay. We can't really get you, but we'll change this law and we can do you from take away your freedom of speech mm. and uh, just everybody shut up and let us deal with what we're dealing with. But people have just had enough. Mm. Did you find it easy then to get into the UK? Was there any moments you thought, fuck me, this is a bit dodgy? On the on the route over? Yeah. It was dodgy as in like, because yeah. we were on a channel bobbing around on a boat, but at no point did, did we come close to getting caught. The only two border force boats we saw and i got a video of it, it was as we approached the coast we saw two of them flying across our front and i actually say on the camera i think it's the border force and it was that was for the two actual boats who'd already landed ahead of us just further down the coast so we, we weren't the only ones out on this channel and they'd only come flying down to intercept them once somebody had seen them on on the beach or probably seen them mm -hmm. approaching they, that was the only... So they weren't even there for you? No, they weren't there for us. And we got arrested eventually. <laughs> but it wasn't until after an hour later. Because the practical reasons were, if we were one of those other boats or actual migrants, as soon as we hit that beach, we're either legging it or going and handing ourselves in. Whatever your preferred option is of what you want to happen afterwards, that's what you do immediately. Of course, we didn't have that option because we had our mate's boat to deflate and the engine and all our kit, and he was driving back over. So he came back across on the ferry. He couldn't get down to the beach because it was a pedestrian promenade, so he had to wait up the top. He borrowed a council landscaper's wheelbarrow to come and do shuttle runs up and down to the van. We were there for over an hour in broad daylight by this point before a single policeman turned up. So we'd have been actual migrants. We we could have done whatever we wanted, gone um, into the wild or hand ourselves in. So the fact that and we were by Folkestone Harbour, right in the mixer. Now you could see we could see as we were coming in. I, I'm on the camera saying there's Dover Port off just to our side. We're we're not sneaking in up when somewhere up near um, East Anglia or somewhere where they're not looking. We're down the the throat of it. And it took over an hour for somebody to come and see what was going on. Um, so, yeah, the defences are pretty are pretty weak there. What did the corporal say to you? It was quite funny because... You could, we, have, been, you could have been a human trafficker, a drug trafficker. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and it didn't swoop because it was waves. First of all, it was a couple of bobbies mm -hmm. just coming and going, what are you up to, lads? And we were messing around with them. Because at this point, as I said, we, we had a passports on us. We haven't broken the law. And we're not actually smuggling people, apart from Gary, the dog. <laughs> um, so we're, we're pissing about with the coppers to get more of a story out of this and have a laugh. What are you up to, lads? Oh, we're just out for the day on the boat. And they obviously picked up on the Welsh accents. What, from fucking Wales? They were like, yeah, we've got to be lost, mate. And that went on for a bit, questioning us, questioning us. And looking back at it now, it's like two blokes have just turned up on a little dinghy unannounced without a good story. Somebody should have swooped other than the bobbies straight away. We were on there for an hour of different waves of people. First, it was a couple of bobbies. And it was, I think, Border Force or Customs turned up. 
eventually the National Crime Agency, but it weren't uh, it weren't uh, a swift operation to detain us. Uh, so we we were messing around, and it's quite funny. My mate dressed up as uh, Where's Wally, the Frenchman, whatever. He was doing a wheelbarrow, a little run past us, and the cop was obviously just wondering what's going on. So he looks over and sees him. And he goes to us, "Is he with you?" And we're like, he shouts over, "Oi!" And Nicky just turns and goes, "Sorry, I speak another the English." And we're just like, "This is going south pretty quickly." Um. Yeah, so Bobby's and National Crime Agency, and eventually they turned up. And what we didn't know at this point, hence why we were messing around with them, was the other two boats that had been commandeered. The two drivers, and this is this shocked me then, and it still does now. The two drivers were ex British military. So, of course, they questioned me, Royal Marine, you're in cahoots with them, you're the decoy boat, or you have brought someone and they've legged it already. So, the two drivers of those boats were. And I don't know how that would have come about, whether they are working for the criminal gangs and there's good money in it. They used to drive boats for the Marines or the Army. Now they're earning a bit of coin over in France for it or whether they've got disillusioned with the military, the UK as a general. They've gone completely the other way and now they're working for these NGO groups who just want to smuggle people over for their own, their own needs. We yeah, don't know. It's madness. Is the UK one of the easiest places to smuggle into, do you think? I know America's got so many um, immigrants, yeah. but the UK I mean, must be up there. Yeah, I mean, America is, they've got that border with Mexico and it's, you know, build the wall on it, Trump, but they're flooding across there. Um, so I'd say they probably got it worse than us. Yeah. What do you think needs to change? And it's funny, isn't it? Because we, we're an island. So with, in Europe, we should be the hardest mm-hmm. to get to. Well, we are, because all the others have got land borders, so you just walk across the border. But they're not taking the easy option. It's it's the hardest option they want, and they'll risk their lives and spend their life savings, or they're probably not. I mean, you need money to get from Central Africa or the Middle East to Northern France, and not just money to get there, to sustain yourself along the way, to stop at the staging posts, to pay people off, to buy food and clothes, and everything else. Does any of the other places in Europe have um, benefits? They'll have them, but clearly they can't be as easy to get as ours. Do you think if we stopped the benefits, the UK wouldn't be a target? Yeah, potentially. I don't really know what... We told them we, that we got the best benefits, and a lot of them said that to us in the camp. We'd, we'd speak to them and say, why do you want to go to England? You're in France. Most people love to live in France. And some would say, oh, my sister's there. That was sort of the standard one because they didn't want to give you too much too information. Much. Yeah, oh, my sister, and try and make it an honourable reason, which you could relate to. But then we are there for a week. So like I said, we made, built relationships with some people and they, and they would just be honest with us. And they'd say that we're told, the, the agents, the not NGO agencies tell us the benefits are much better. Put this on the form. Tell them you've been persecuted for this back on the other side tell them you've got family members there and you want to you want to reconnect with that network even if you haven't if you've got a mate who runs a car wash in hull tell them you've got a sister up there and then they'll try and get you up there so there is a lot of there's good benefits out there and they're well educated about them it's crazy that people are just giving them the information to find the loopholes to then claim the benefits to then it's crazy how they can get benefits without ids or passports and being Commit crime straight yeah. away. It's just all these, backwards. These to me. groups are known. Yeah. I, I, we, we don't, didn't only find out about these no borders groups because we went there. When I got back, back home, I googled them, and they've got a web page. It's probably still active now. No borders. It must be, and it says on there what their goal is. And you're like, really? They're yeah. that brazen about it. They got a website telling everyone what they want to do, and the government haven't shut them down. I'm pretty sure if you had a website saying, let's go and burn a hotel or anything deemed illegal, the government would be, they'd be on it, shut yeah. down, investigated, f- find the source of it, and be stamped out. So how come these groups are actively telling us what they want to do, which is illegal, yet they're still able to do it? 
Yeah, it's crazy. So how's life been since it then? It's been a bit of a roller coaster with the social media, everybody want to speak to you, because it's such a hot topic and there's not many people who've done that sort of thing. And I think you've got to be well trained and well organised to kind of get through that as well. Do you know what I'm saying? I think if anybody done that, their life would be in danger. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah. And your books, what's the books? Your four books, let's plug them. Yeah, so three of them are the Tramp Face stuff, which I mentioned of the homeless. Mm -hmm. And the first Calais trip is the second book. The most recent one hasn't been written yet. And then the fourth one is my autobiography. So a little bit of the early life, not too much, because it gets straight. It could be three books in one with the stories in there. 120,000 words straight into joining the Marines, Arctic, jungle, desert, smaller trips abroad, and then the four big tours, Iraq, uh, three Afghanistan, nearly getting captured uh, or escaping a kidnapped attempt in Baghdad. Yeah, what was that one? What was that one? Have we got time for that? Yeah. So the first tour, Baghdad, amazing. My, f my first tour, what I've dreamed of, and not only that, I'm going out to do the pinnacle of UK forces operations. General routine was we'd go out at night and... That's okay, bro. <laughs> a routine there was we'd go out at night and kill a capture, kick doors in, get people out of their beds, bring them back high level targets, not your pipe swingers, foot soldiers. During the day, we'd have a bit of downtime then unless there was a daytime job sometimes there was so myself and one of the paratroopers mark he was a trauma medic i was just the basic medical skills that any marine would have but we were muckers traditional enemies as the status quo goes with marines of paras but they're not it's the same as anything if, if you're man united you need a rival otherwise you get fat and lazy same with the marines and the paras but we were good muckers so in the day we come up with this little scheme plan to go to the American hospital down in Baghdad and help out. Flirt with the nurses, use all their welfare facilities, the internet and uh, swimming pool, and enjoy that for a little bit. So each day we'd, because we weren't on a regular operation, we would dress in civilian clothing, sign out a civilian car from the motor pool, and then drive, make our own way down. It's an area in Baghdad called the Green Zone, and it's a protected area with all the contractors and civilians and stuff work in amongst the hell that is Baghdad. So we'd sign all this cut out. We'd take a pistol with us only, and we'd drive down to the hospital, go there, flip with the nurses, hang around for a bit, head back. There are only two routes back from the hospital back to our camp. So we couldn't really put much deception in for setting patterns. So this particular day, we'd left it a bit late. It was getting dark, which we always tried to avoid uh, before heading back. We'd set off and we were driving towards uh, a roundabout. So as we were approaching, we could see up ahead, it was rush hour in Iraqi time. There was quite a bit of traffic and up ahead by the roundabout, there was a commotion going on. So we're both sort of looking at it inquisitively, what's going on. As we're looking ahead of this commotion, we see a few guys who look armed and they're not wearing uniforms. A lot of people armed in this green zone, civilian and military. There's no uniforms. We're wearing a sort of black tracksuit, pajama type uh, outfits with AK 47s. Right, this has got our attention now. As we're doing this, to, to our right was uh, as a line of woods. From the line of woods, a long guy just walks out right in front of our car, turns around, and just raises. Is AK-47 at, at the window screen. So we're like, boom, silence. You, you got our attention. Immediately in that car, as with anything in the military, you're trying to work out what is, what's going on here. I try and assess it. And what do I need to do about it? Two very different emotions getting played out in the front of this car. Marx was more hasty and urgent. Right, shit, we got to do something. We got to do it now. Whereas mine was the opposite which was, well, hang on a minute, let's not do something too hasty and make it worse and work out what is actually going on at the minute because we don't really know yet. We've got an idea. So this has been played out. And what I spoke about before is a lot of people will go through life and not find out 
something that certain thing about themselves or how they would react in a situation. I'd never been in that situation before, and I didn't know. You like to think you'd know, but my obviously natural reaction obviously was to not panic, if you like, or or not just panic, but just act too brashly. Marx was the opposite. Let's let's do something. And the balance between the two, as it turned out, because I'm still sat here, worked out to be the best option. So Mark gets the way of carrying a mobile phone and it's attached to our quick reaction force, which is uh, some of our guys and some of the SAS guys back on camp who would come and react to any situation like this. So Mark gets the phone out, no signal. Great. So at this point, I've got my pistol underneath. I'm sat on it. So it's pointing towards me, but underneath my ass. Loaded, but not made ready. So there's no chance of me shooting myself in the ass. Shooting your dick off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <I'm> big. <laughs> so immediately, <clears throat> I'm, pull, I'm getting that ready. So I pull it out, and <clears throat> this gunman has signaled himself to me now as the sprog. They've sent the most junior guy, which is their policy, because he's the most likely to get shot in this situation. They know we're carrying weapons. We've been targeted. So they're like, we'll send him because if, if they do start shooting, he's going to catch it up first. So he hadn't asked us to put our hands up on the dashboard, which he should have done in that situation straight away. Of course you do, because he, he's going to know we're armed. He hadn't. So I'm like, right, this is the sprog. We can, we can maybe leverage him a little bit here. So pistol out, cocked it down out uh, below the dash, out of view, just so that we were ready if we, we wanted to act. Mark's now saying, it's a snatch attempt, mate. I'm going to put my foot down, go through him, J turn it then, and get out of here. And there's traffic all around us. So I was like, well, don't do that, Mark. Let's take a moment, because if you do do that, he's just going to open fire. At the minute, he's not firing. If he, w if he was there to execute us, he'd have done it by now, long ago. And, that, and we know that isn't their plan, because they, they kill American troops every day in Baghdad. They don't capture them every day. There's a lot more value in that for them than just shooting us dead. They could do that any day of the week. And then the conversation is, right, Mark, it's got to be a snatch. I said, like, yeah, it probably is. And then Mark goes, do you remember the intelligence brief from Mick, our sergeant, a few days ago? I was like, yeah, roughly. He said, that the Al-Qaeda Iraq are planning to snatch a Westerner from the green zone between the 22nd and 24th of September. Today's the 23rd. So we're both like, fuck. Listening to that brief, just going, yeah, all right, they're going to snatch a hospital worker or something, not knowing that these guys have been watching us to, to get our movements over the last however long. And it's obvious, I thought about this afterwards, and people have asked me, how, how did they know who you were and where you were going to be? And each day we go into that hospital, you got to unload your pistol, for the because there's American troops there, but it's also private security guards, people from like India and the Middle East and um, Africa that they've paid peanuts for to come and be security. We've got no loyalties like the US troops have. So we'd unload our pistols every day and obviously you have to show some ID. And Mark says British Army, mine says Royal Navy. So clearly at this point, the information is going, there's two guys who turn up every day in an unmarked car in civilian clothes with pistols, longish hair, unshaven, One's got British Army ID, one's got Royal Navy ID. So that sets us apart to the normal security guards who are working out of there. These guys are undercover or special agents or special forces or something like that. So now we know they're here for us. We, <clears throat> this is a kidnapped attempt. So the options are try and, try and drive through it, maybe try and bust our way out of it. So I start playing dumb. So I start going to the guy, I'll see your pistol's back between... My legs facing the other way now, going, motioning that I, I don't understand him. And he starts coming towards us. So the options are now, well, I could do him through the side window. I got the pistol. We could do him. So I said to Mark, right, if I do him through the window, now you can J-turn it and get it out of here. Give us a bit of distance between the, the actual gunman on, on the roundabout. As he approaches, I decided not to do that. Again, let's, let's keep trying to weigh up the options and he starts point, pointing towards the roundabout. So just drive forward. So I'm like, right, Mark, right, just 
just do what he says for now and we'll keep weighing it up. Mark keeps pulling forward in the car towards the roundabout and it's four gunmen there now with all with AKs. They're stopping the traffic, making sure there's a clear route for us. Up ahead, the, the right turn off the roundabouts, we're driving on the right-hand side of the road, is an exit checkpoint to the what they call the red zone, which is Greater Baghdad, Wild West, Badlands. So it's clear now that he wants us to go out of that exit. Because once we do, we're anybody's. Snatch us, and nobody's going to find you then. Mark's going, it's the red zone. I ain't going into the red zone. I was like, no, me neither. Right, do what he says for now. I said, once we get to that roundabout, we'll pull off to the side, we'll jump out, get the pistols out, and then maybe drop him and leg it into the woods or get out of here because we're not going out, out of that checkpoint. And I don't really want to get any closer to the, to the four guys with AK-47s. Do that, and as we pull off the roundabout, now stops the car. Mark and me both jump out. Mark comes around to my side of the vehicle with his pistol as well now. Pistol's out, drawn over the top of the vehicle towards this sprog who's watching us. And the look of like disbelief and shock on his face was brilliant because he was the cat was amongst the pigeons here. He was like, this wasn't meant to happen. These two guys are meant to do what I said because I'm pointing a weapon at him. And here they are, they've jumped out and now we're pointing weapons at him. Standoff going off. The other guys are shouting at him from the roundabout. He's looking over his shoulder shot and he's getting a bit twitchy now. So I'm a bit concerned that he is going to start shooting because he's lost control of it now. We're not doing what he said. We're not contained in the car. So I said to Mark, right, we're going to drop him and we're going to leg it in, into the woods. At this point, again, he's, the guys on the roundabout have realised we ain't playing ball. They've then pulled over another car, which has uh, two women in it. Dragged them out, and they're um, American women. So I call over to them. Oh, they shout out, they're trying to get us to go out of the red zone. They're trying to get us out of the I said, don't go out of the red zone. We're British forces. Try and get back in the car. So they hadn't, they didn't have hands on them. They, he directed them, the, the sprog guy, for them to get out. So conversations I had, get back in the car, don't go, don't go out of the red zone. So I'm saying to Mark, well, we've got to act now because I'm a I'm a proud man, but two pistols against five AK 47s, I I'm pretty much sure we're gonna lose this firefight. As we're about to take action, up on the roundabout, it's another commotion. An American convoy has now approached it with their heavy machine guns on top. And the cheeky bastards have stopped them, these guys with the AKs. And the, the Americans aren't messing around. They're like, fuck you. Cock their .5 uh, caliber machine gun. And they're on the tannoy now. We are American forces. You are not authorized to stop us. Get the fuck out of the way. So I'm like, I had to bark now, right? We're not opening fire now. Because those Yanks aren't going to fuck about. If they see two guys, they don't know who we are. They just see two guys shooting from across from them when they're being held by an armed gunman, they're going to sh start shooting us and we're definitely not going to win against against them. Yanks are now braced up against them, weapons pointed at them, and at this point the terrorists are like, fuck, chance is gone. Drop their weapons and leg it through the, uh, through the, the red checkpoint out of the gate. Bizarre moment then, because the security guard just stood and watched them. You've got Iraqi police and Iraqi army on this guard. Didn't do anything. So they're obviously in on it, corrupt, uh, and up to no good. And then it's just a surreal moment where me and Mark just sort of looked at each other. I'm like, let's get back to camp then. And got back, got back in the car and drove back to back to the camp. What makes a good soldier? Um, lots of things. Fitness, got to be, gotta be fit for the start. But key thing for me that rather than just making a good soldier, but if you want to be a good soldier and be good at it for a career, I think you've got to be level-headed and not get carried away and look at things look at things from, from a neutral point of view. You can't always be gung-ho, too aggressive, or always wanting to be... Always wanted to be on the front foot and not stepping back and thinking about things. 
a little bit more. So I think, yeah, just having that, that assurance and that me- measured opinion on everything. What's the worst thing about being a soldier? Shaving every day. Fucking hated that. Absolutely. You can probably tell now. Uh, absolutely hate them. I guess one of the worst things is having to follow orders that you disagree with. Not that are wrong, because if they are morally wrong or illegal, then you can not follow them. Otherwise, you're complicit in whatever act that you, you've been ordered to do. But there's a lot of times where, you know, that's bullshit. Or, and he knows it's bullshit, but we're doing it just because we're in the military and there's a lot of bullshit. So one of the worst things is just having to suck it up all the time. And you'll hear the, the lad saying it, just got to suck it up, just got to get on with it. It is what it is. Um, but a lot of people would say something different. Maybe he'd been away all the time. I love that. Didn't get homesick at all. Just love being away and the adventure of it. But definitely, yeah, just shaving and having to suck it up. What do you think looking back in your life? Would you change anything? Mm, in my life in general, I made a lot of mistakes, but it's hard to... Choices, like sort of choices I'd made that haven't gone disastrously wrong, then no. Would I change dropping into that hole and drinking when I come out of COVID? Yes, but also no, because that's taught me a lot. And actually my life is better for that now. I know it is because I don't really drink now. What I mean by that is the odd wedding or whatever as as a daily thing. I don't even think about it. It's not a struggle for me. I never had the urge to do it anyway. I was, oh, I always had to have a drink. Once you get into it and you fall into that hole, then yeah, you do get that urge. But now, if I hadn't, that hadn't happened, I'd still be drinking like I was in the Marines, which was pretty much any chance you got. In the Marines, you could be away for, for two weeks, you couldn't drink, and then you just blast it for the whole week that you could. So that I'd still be doing that now. I'd be drinking every weekend, and I own a bar. At any, every day, there would be an excuse to have a drink. Somebody pops in I haven't seen for ages. Something's broken and I've fixed it. Well done, mate. Have a pint. Something's gone fuck, disastrously wrong. Fuck, this is a nightmare. I've had a titful. I'm having a drink. So no doubt if that hadn't happened, unless something else, some some kind of other intervention, I'd still be drinking like I was back then, which wasn't good either. In a lot of ways, even though those that period was full on and close as you could get to, to ruin. Now spreading that out to not drinking for so long, it's come to balance it. Whereas now I, I'd, I'd have been, still been drinking that whole period from leaving the Marines like I was when I was in the Marines. So a lot of good's come out of that. Um, yeah, so... For anybody watching, Lee, that's in a life of struggle right now, you've battled yourself, you've come out the other end, what advice would you have for them? Uh, it's got to be don't give up because... I'm sure you've been there as well there's times where you think you've got to give up there's there's no other option here I can't see a way out of it so it's got to be don't give up that is a lot easier said than done isn't it because a lot of people do give up unfortunately um, don't be stubborn but also be stubborn one of the things that got me out of that was my stubbornness it got me into it because I was like I don't need anyone I can do everything on my own. I'm fucking kick ass. I've got through everything that's ever been thrown at me. Let's have it. But then what got me out of it was my stubbornness of showing people that they were wrong because a lot of people wrote me off, rightly so. I'd written myself off, so show myself. And yeah, that stubbornness was then what got me out of it because I say to a lot of people, I say to everyone that listen, when I was in that mess, I I was getting lots of help as well, but you could be in the only person to get you out of that is you and your own stubbornness or whatever it is that you draw on because you, that situation I was in, I could have had all the help in the world or none of the help in the world. And it wouldn't have mattered unless my own self help kicked in. It doesn't matter how much help they give me. If I didn't decide how I was going to react to that help, it was a waste of time. But also I could have, could have had, I did have loads of help. I could have had no help at all, 
But if then I turned around and went, I'm going to get out of it, that would have worked as well. So it's it's only down to you and take the help that it's there, but you've got to make that decision. Nobody else can make it. A couple of times in an interview, you've kind of, as if you were going to go and you've ruined it back. What was going through your mind, can I ask? On? Twice, I don't know, at the start of the interview, you kind of stopped and kind of adjusted yourself. I think your mm. your mind went a different place. Like, does that do it frequently where you, your mind takes you somewhere and then you kind of got to bring it back? Yeah, massively, especially that period, so much happened and I got so much in my mind about it now. Like I had to think and draw on what was that one thing because there's, there's loads in there about it wasn't just this happened and this stopped it there was a magnitude of different things thrown in there and you do for, try and forget a lot of it because a lot of that was very painful not mm -hmm. just for me for what i was feeling personally but what it did to other people it really hurts me to think about um my mother breaking down and crying so yeah, you you shut a lot of it off and go, I, I don't want to think about that anymore because I am ashamed of it. And when we talk about have you got regrets or things you'd change, of course, if I could change my mother breaking down crying in front of me thinking she was going to lose her son in a heartbeat, definitely. Um, so things like that, you definitely uh, would change and you do block them out. And yeah. when you're asked about it, you got to go back and go, well, where have I where have I put that away? It's in there somewhere. I know it is because it... It destroyed me for a bit. But fair play, it shows you your character and you seem like a right fucking staunch guy. You seem Cheers, solid, you mate. You seem as if you're up for a good crack. You seem to try and find the balance and you're a leader for a reason because you, you understand why people would follow your orders. You seem to be on it and we all fuck up. We all make mistakes. It's rightly so with the shit they've seen, the shit you've been involved in. It's uh, stuff that nobody wants to see. Do you ever look at humans? Well, humans, fuck's sake, we're all human, but do you ever look at people in the UK where who've never seen the stuff that you or your comrades have seen and they're complaining and you think, what the fuck are you complaining about? Do you feel envious of that? Or do you kind of look at them and think, you don't know what you've, you don't know what's actually out there? Yeah. I feel envious in different ways sometimes, as in people who are going on with their life and just happy with it. They're not the ones who are complaining, who are just ticking along. They don't need anything in particular or drastic going on and they're just happy with it i'm like a fucking envious of you because i haven't got that because of all the stuff i've done and how it everything has spiked my emotions on the absolute extreme i know i can't i couldn't live that life so there's a lot of times where it's not the people moaning we do do that as well stop fucking moaning when it gets a bit hot here i'm like it's fucking 45 degrees in afghan and a body armor and a helmet on somebody shooting at me yeah. um but yeah, look at him and think I I'm jealous. I wish I wish I could uh just live a basic non complicated life. And I can't. So it definitely does Where's the fucking fun in that Leon? Exactly, that's fun, mate, that's exactly. fun living that that's, ordinary you, life you, without being you fucked must, up. You must mate. have something chipped in my in my yeah, mind, mate. You, you, fuck me. You're saying that you're they saying boring that to me. bastards, mate. Why not? <laughs> fuck shut up. It's yeah. uh but like I say, mate, how are you feeling today? Telling your story, we're quite in depth for a lot of stuff, and obviously yeah. with them, um, the undercover immigrant stuff, which is powerful to show people mm. how easy it is to get into the UK. Yeah. Um, but how are you feeling yourself? Yeah, fucking great, mate. It's I could talk for weeks about. It. Well, I've written books, so I don't mind bored people too much with them because I spoke of this before as well. I've normalized all these stories I've told you today. I've normalized them, so I do bore myself telling them. And I was like, I oh, know you fucking bored us as well, mate. <laughs> so, because uh, because they, they're completely natural to me, I've thought about them a million times. I've mm -hmm. told them a few times, and when you sit down and talk about them, then you're like, well, actually, they're not that normal to other people, probably. So, going back and telling them again is a good refresher to me. Is because I, I do know them inside out, but that Iraq kidnap one, I probably haven't told that story for years, mm -hmm. and. It's, yeah, it's great to, and I will, I, I'll never tell the same story twice. So you can tell me to tell a story and it'll come out different, not because the facts of it aren't different, but I'll have so many different thoughts about it at the time that I've thought about over the years as well, but you forget some and then you'll be telling me like, oh, fuck yeah, remember when I thought that about it? 
Um, but yeah, I do I do enjoy telling them. It is a little refreshing, a little reminder of what you've been through, and hopefully people can relate, especially to the to the ones where you've been in tough situations. What about all your social medias, Lee, for people to get in contact? Like I say, after this podcast, out, everybody will want you on their platform, but it's mm. good for book sales, it's good for exposure. And like I say, you're a great storyteller. You've lived the tale, you've come out the other end, you've battled your darkness, mm. trying to get through life. It's just a fucking roller coaster, isn't it, yeah. brother? But what you can, all you can do is put your hands up and try and enjoy it as much as you can. Yeah. But what's your social medias for people to get in contact with you? Yeah, just want to say, first of all, absolute pleasure to come here, mate. I, I said I got, got all of your stuff years ago. I was like, fucking hell, that's brilliant. Uh, followed it. And then, obviously, we're in the back of my mind, going, oh, man, one day maybe I'll get into that game. And you, and you never think you'd actually be sat here. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. That's, that's fucking brilliant. Uh, yeah, I never yeah. thought it would have happened this soon, at least. So that's that's amazing, and yeah, all the the socials we got my YouTube channel, which, which now has blown up a little bit, which is great now because it'll give me a chance to go and talk about stuff or do videos of stuff that I thought uh, do, is it worth wasting time doing that when no one's really going to watch it. Whereas now I can go, well, actually, yeah, I will do it because there's a few people following now, and maybe they will be interested in it and find my feet on that. So the YouTube's Wolf of the World. Then I got your X. It's Royal Marine LW, um, Lee West. That should be if you just type my Instagram, name in, Facebook. I got Instagram. I'm absolutely gashing it. Um, I'm great at Facebook because, as my niece tells me, I'm fucking old. So, mm -hmm. of course, I'm only good at Facebook. Facebook, uh, we got the Wolf of the World channel as well. I got a business in South Wales called Copper Bar Swansea, Craft Beer Bar right in the centre. You're probably not going to get near it in the next couple of months from all the far left uh, Free Palestine guys who are already getting on my back from that GB News interview and probably this because <laughs> they can't see. They probably didn't even watch it, but they just go, he's on that, he's this. Yeah. And th the stick coming from that already, but as we said earlier, fucking bring it on. Yeah, he gives um, a fuck. It's, it's yeah. just sad that everybody's went so far left, so far right, but there's no compromise in the middle. Yeah. Have a, have a discussion. Yeah, there's exactly. problems everywhere. We're not against yeah. anyone. We're just concerned over family, our kids, fucking grandkids. We're just concerned. Mm. We're concerned human beings, mm. not racists, not far right, not hooligans. We're just concerned for mm. our people. That's it. But that's and, the problem. They slag me off for going and talking to other people. It's a couple of guys who do a fairly right-wing podcast. They drink in the bar. I'm hated by association. And as I say to them, I say, well, come and talk to me because they do. So if they can come and talk to me and we can get on, why? But that's that's exactly the problem. Instead of just coming and talking and yeah. then making their mind up that I'm a dickhead and they hate me, well, fair enough, at least you've heard me mm. out. But they won't. And that's, that's my main problem with them is the blinkers are on and they just won't. Yeah, that's not good for anything. anybody. That's what the destruction heightens that's where there's no change yeah. and that's where people are too fucking silly to have the blinkers on like you says mm -hmm. but lee like i says staunch guy unbelievable story thank you for your service my brother thank you for everything that you're doing and uh yeah keep up the good work and i wish you all the best for the future brother thank you mate god Appreciate bless it. you mate cheers, cheers man.